right. Hey, guys. I'm here with C. Derek Vaughn. Uh, could you introduce introduce yourself? Hey, I'm C. Derek Vaughn, um, and I am a podcast host of a bunch of different podcasts in America. <laughs> Though, I guess the country that you podcast from is somewhat irrelevant except for your accent preference. I work for Zero Books. I am a school teacher by trade. I'm writing a book on Christopher Lash. I'm a poet. And I was an expatriate for about nine years and uh, came home um, to the States um, somewhat unexpectedly due to um, uh, family medical complications, specifically my ex-wife having cancer. And uh, I came back to Trump. Now, a lot of people freaked out about like, oh, you picked the wrong time to come back. And um, in some ways I did. But Trump isn't why, actually. Um, it was a bad time to come back. So um, I am one of those weird Americans who is not a total provincial because, you know, one of the things about being a cultural hegemon, and you will also see this if you deal with future cultural hegemons like um, people from China, uh, is you get the, you, you actually, by being in the center of power, you get to be pretty provincial. <laughs> um, you don't have to care about other people's media. You don't have to care about other people's um, languages because everybody speaks yours. Uh, so that doesn't that doesn't so much apply to me, actually. But yeah, so that's my background. I guess uh, so your listeners might know I come from a Marxist background, but my education, properly speaking, is in um, education theory, poetry, and uh, English English and anthropology, which is kind of a an awkward set of trainings that I initially did to be a science writer then a lawyer, um, and realizing both of those were dead ends, um, and became a poet and a, and, a, and a high school teacher instead. And now I am kind of a jack-of-all-trades intellectual, so it's a very strange background, but yeah. You've also been on, like, every single left-wing podcast. Almost. I mean, I haven't been on Chapel Trap House. and uh, But, you know, what's funny is I've been doing left-wing podcasts um, and philosophy podcasts before they were common. So, like, when I started doing left-wing podcasts, there was Diet Soap from Alpha 2 Omega, Seeing Red Radio, and a bunch of Pacifica radio shows, like Democracy Now! and Doug Henwood stuff. And that was it, actually. Like, um, most of the political podcasts were libertarian. Mm, um, yeah, when no, I that, started working on this. Yeah, yeah. Movie. That's that's been one of the biggest sea changes. I got into this whole weird politics thing uh, in, like, 2015. I ended up stumbling across, because I'm a middle-class white male, I ended up, you know, just being summoned to listen to libertarian podcasts. And then I just found my way to this weird anarchist position I hold. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's pretty normal for people my age, honestly. Yeah, I, I think that's a lot of people's politicization if you're an Anglo speaker and you're subject to, you know, Anglo-American media and um, if you're a millennial, um, yeah. you know. And I am... Uh, I like to talk about how I'm how I'm between two reactionary generations, but differently. <laughs> but you know, I am either the oldest millennial or the youngest Gen Xer, depending on how you define it. So that's where I'm at. I, I'm one of the. I, I'm a. I'm a person who grew up with both the internet and the and the Cold War. So it's you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's a little different. Yeah, I think um, so I think a good way to like actually start talking about stuff. I think that a lot like. And we've gotten away from it a little, but I think, like, across the morass that is weird online politics, I think that the shadow of the Cold War, like, influences and colors things more than people realize. Oh, I think it does hugely. I mean, like, I think, for example, this phenomenon of inter of internet Marxist-Leninism is a kind of disillusioning with the Cold War, but just inverts its narratives. Like, it yeah, yeah, just, yeah. you know, it picks the other Cold War narrative as the truth. It's not particularly yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, critical of, of, yeah. of the Cold War narrative. It just inverts it. Yeah. I, I think, I think um, what I was thinking more of, and it's a little more sophisticated, uh, although, you know, that's not saying much. I think, um, I think like the online right, I think is actually uh, far more shaped by the sort of like, alliances that were made during the cold war and like factions that are oh totally i i think that 
like basically like the Trump phenomena, but also like even around more like reified, uh, no, uh, more like savvy and like intellectual types, like, you know, like Nick Land or Curtis Yarvin. Uh, I think like the trajectories that like them and their communities have gone, uh, I think, I think like really is a reaction to uh, like, like, like um, I think, I think a good like example of this is like when Nick Land was, you know, back in like 2020, no 2012 or like 2013, was coming up with his um like dark enlightenment stuff he's like he was like explicitly like yeah you know like we're gonna get like racists theocrats and like you know unapologetic libertarian capitalists together to fight to fight the leftists and we all know we don't agree on everything uh but we just want to fight leftists um and he was explicit about that right um it's it's the tentacle beast version of the reagan coalition right i mean yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. he's like uh you know um like uh, H.P. Lovecraft plus William F. Buckley. Right. Well, he's really more H.P. Lovecraft pr- plus Joe Sobrin plus cybernetic theory. But, but yeah, I mean, so f- for your Australian listeners, you might know a little bit of my political background. I was radicalized left in my mid-20s, but I actually come out of the paleoconservative right that opposed the neoconservatives in the early aughts and where a lot of the weirdos are. And that narrative was totally shaped by the Cold War and the coalition, the, the coalitions that is causing the quote unquote, there's two things driving the quote unquote realignment and its inability to happen in the United States right now. One is the weirdness of our class politics. And the other yeah. is the fact that even the evangelical wing of conservatism since the seventies has had a Bircher, a John Bircher core. Um, that it's full of conspiracy theories and was willing to make a coalition uh, between like hawkish liberals mm. who would later become called neoconservatives. Um, yep. You know, like uh, disciples of Leo Strauss, former Marxist um, yep. people associated for the Congress of American Freedom yep. Um, yep. with, with evangelicals after the evangelicals lost their populist streak in the, you know, they, mm-hmm. they started abandoning that in the sixties. Um, and when, um, and with neo-confederates, um, you know, I mean, and, and there are even weirder ends of this because you got to remember parts of like, people always talk about Nixon and the Southern strategy in America, mm-hmm. getting all the Southern states to do all this race baiting, but they were also at the same time, um, encouraging like former Panthers and people, you know, like Alex Haley, the guy who wrote, um, the Malcolm X autobiography was a Nixonite. And that, that's where all this like black entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurial black power stuff was actually supported by the Republican party at the time, um, to try to get the black vote, wrestle it away from the Democrats where it had been since 1930, since the second, um, the second term of FDR, you know, and they tried it again during the Bush years that like during the Bush years that you would see, um, during George Bush, uh, the second Bush, um, you'd see stuff like, well, you know, Democrats were the party of segregation, which is actually historically true, but to try to like break up the, the, the weird democratic coalition, and those co- the Democratic coalition is less informed by the Cold War, but still kind of informed by it. Um, for example, the existence of a party of a broad coalition of groups that theoretically communist in America, which was a tiny, tiny faction. I mean, you know, a couple of thousand ever. But like the CPUSA was in a popular front with the Democrats at the same time the segregationists were still in the party. Like, and so, so like so that, the, much, it, 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 that weird stuff is all in the DNA of American politics. I, I'm sure some of it is just like unique American weirdness, but how much of that is like, you know, just a lack of, uh, you, you can't really run competitive third parties. Uh, a lot of it's that I mean, there's also the fact that our party history is, is quite different from the rest of the world in that we had voter based um, political parties earlier than everywhere else. Um, but, uh, and in, you know, when I say voter base, like, yes, the, yes, the, you know, the mothership of all political weirdness, Great Britain is where political parties really 
like formalize. Um, but they are parliamentary parties. They're, they're not really broad voter based parties. Broad voter based parties in America started pretty early on. I mean, like within 30 years of the Republic's founding. Um, however, they weren't class parties. And um, my friend uh, Gene, who's, um, who's Kurdish, and I have talked about this a couple times, the American party system uh, is kind of weird in that it comes out of the beginnings of bourgeois development in the United States. Right. And so, like, the Republican Party was always clearly the party of business, um, and so, it, like, when business is progressive, it's progressive. When business is not progressive, it's not. But that doesn't that that doesn't imply that the Democrats weren't. And we never had a labor party. And when there was any fear that it might happen, um, the Democrats and the Republicans together um, passed Taft Hartley to make sure that that could never happen in the United States. So that there could not be even even with non competitive third parties. The idea of like what happened in Britain, where the Labour Party supplanted the Liberal Party. Sorry, so how how mm-hmm. I'm vaguely aware of what Taff Hartley uh, is, but like what? Uh, so I believe it's like a set of regulations that say you are allowed to have legal unions, but uh, you can't do a bunch of stuff. Because I, I know it like emerged in like the middle of um, like a lot of wildcat strikes and labor unrest. And so they're like, okay, we'll give you legal protections, but you can't use these uh, uh, tactics that like are quite effective, like wildcat strikes. So right. how well, how would have that? So, how does that labor party from forming? Well, it also stops stops political uh, striking for political right. aims and striking yeah. for solidarity strikes all become illegal and a way to lose your labor protections. Right. So those were really the mechanisms for how in in Germany and the UK for how the the idea of the labor parties coalescing and to do political actions and coordinating both electorally and with strikes happened. And when when they when they started worrying about that in the US, they wanted to make sure that never happened here. So that was part and parcel of what they put in. Taff Hartley. So Taff Hartley has a bunch of, of labor protections, but it also has a bunch of effectively poison pills yeah, um, yeah. for the labor movement. Um, and so like, the labor movement's weak everywhere on the planet, but it's why, like, even in like in the United States, it's weak even for the Anglo world. And the Anglo world's where it's the weakest anyway. But that also means that, like, we don't really have clear class parties in the way yeah. that a lot of other places have had. And what I've seen, actually, interestingly, in Europe, particularly in Britain, but it's beginning to happen everywhere, is that the class party notion, even though you've had, like, Corbynism and all that, if you actually look at the voting patterns, what is happening to them is an Americanization of their politics, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, Where... uh, I'm gonna... So, I don't have the stats on hand with me right now, but... um, Actually, so Will Wilkinson of the Niskansen Center, mm-hmm. which is like libertarian, but not really, he wrote this paper, uh, I think it's the density divide, where he basically makes mm-hmm. the case that, you know, politics around the world is becoming about like urban versus rural. And I imagine that's what's like happening with labor, right? Yeah, that, that's what's happening with labor. Yeah. And, 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 and the- urban and rural divides have gotten more pronounced everywhere. So that codes to a lot of different things. So it codes to religiosity, but it also codes to it codes to age. Um, it codes to education. So you can't say, for example, I mean, one of the weird things about Democrats in America is their coalition. If you look at their voting stats, is is both not the richest richest. So that like the real the the hot bourgeoisie, the old money, um, is is pretty much split fifty fifty on parties. But the tier right beneath them, so the people who make over two hundred thousand dollars a year, that you, you tell them like really successful, like professional labor aristocrats, um, urban small businesses, stuff like that, they're Democrats. And then the next category of people who vote Democratic tends to be under eighty k a year, so you know the working poor. But Republicans have this weird thing in the United States where the areas that vote for Republican tend to be poorer than the areas that vote for Democrats. Yeah. Um, more of the country's poor. <laughs> uh, you can see where, um, but but the average Republican voter actually makes between, at least for the presidency. I actually haven't looked at the stats for uh, for down ballot stuff, 
but the average Republican voter for Trump makes above a hundred k a hundred thousand dollars a year, mm. but less than two hundred thousand, and normally lives in these areas that are rural. And, um, yeah. you know, and actually are systemically poorer than the rest of the country, which leads you to like, it, it, you realize that like you were talking about two very specific and in liberal terms, broadly middle class factions fighting each other and uh, the working class kind of just picking sides, you know, but, but yes, the density and age is the biggest predictor yeah. The density, the, the population density of where you live and your age is the biggest predictor of how you're going to vote, I think, in most yeah. of the world. And it's definitely true in the United States, even more than your yeah. social class, even more than your gender, even more than your race. <laughs> Although, yeah, the the racial distribution is by no means even. So, sorry, I don't want to bore your listeners with the boring, no, 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 you know, this, nitpickiness this of other, American politics. You know, but, like, this is uh, abstensive. Atticus podcast. Uh, I think it's. I think these trends, even if like you don't care about electoralism, are worth paying attention to. And you know, like obviously, a Labour Party and why it didn't form, even if you don't like have any interest in that. I think it's worth knowing that history. So thank you for that. Um, I think. I think one thing, uh, and I, I, I think I found a book about this, uh, but I didn't get it. But um, I, I think one thing that would be interesting is seeing how, uh, like, personality types and age and stuff, all those characteristics, uh, map onto occupation. Because Yeah, so the, there, is, there are studies on this in the United States. So this guy, uh, Jonathan Haidt's the most famous guy, and he's really oh, yeah, obnoxious. Yeah. But, um, yes. but um, there's some other people who do work on moral tribe theory and talk mm-hmm. about self-selection of personality types and stuff into into certain fields. I will say though, my, my response to moral tribe theory was like, they have a pretty good analysis for why, like you have a bell curve distribution. If you look at the general population of the United States of conservative, liberal and on, and on tip, I don't temperament scales, but they have a hard time explaining why that bell curve doesn't apply when you start breaking down sub demographics. And that could be, and that's not just age. Uh, so race is a big one where the where, where you do see this spread, but it is nowhere near a kind of what you'd expect on a general, like this is a natural, hu- because they kind of argue that like liberal and conservative temperaments are just natural to the human species and it's two different adaptation, mm-hmm. uh, you know, social adaptation regimes. And then you have mm-hmm. to point out, well, okay, if that's, that might be true, but your argument that it's mostly genetic don't make sense if you're looking at the fact that, uh, these change by region and these change by social class and race in ways that um, don't I track really, on to I really, genetic I really difference. Would like them to do, sorry, I really would like to see them, uh, you know, do one of those studies in like a third world country uh, or, you know, like, yeah, I, I would too. So they did a bunch of like, so the height study is in a bunch of countries, but the study itself is in English. So of course, yeah. If yeah. you're going to be, even if you're not Western, you've accepted a, a certain, yeah. and, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm a software warfist or anything. And for those who don't know what that yeah. means, if you believe that language determines your consciousness, uh, but that, <laughs> that, you know, I just don't believe that, uh, that it, that if you, if you were taking that with totally, you know, totally well translated things, you're not, and yeah. you set it up um, in every society that it would really look the same. And the other yeah, thing you, you, that I don't buy, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say, like, you're obviously smuggling stuff, some stuff in, and then also I think there's just the fact that, like, um, over the past like couple of decades, uh, one like statistic that I think is like really profound, and not enough people are talking about. I think like we're really reaching like uh, I think like you know everyone on the planet is like close to being you know, one or two, uh, links or what, 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 what's that? Um, Kevin Bacon thing. I can't remember it right now. This is so interesting. Yeah. Uh, but like everyone, like, like smartphone penetration has gotten like pretty crazy high. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, most people like my age, like don't appreciate like what a big deal I've had, but like, you know, there's like a- a- occasionally like on social media, like every year or so, <laughs> Uh, someone will be like, you know, like the computer in your hand, uh, like has more processing power than like, like all the computers on the earth, 
when we sent like people to the moon. Um, that's right. that's like a really really big deal. I think um, that I don't think I, people really understand how ubiquitous it is either. Because like when uh, I was in North Africa, um, which I lived for two years in Egypt, and you know, I, uh, y- you could even go to like rural Upper Egypt, right, uh, which is in the south coast of Sudan. Mm-hmm. And you're you go to places that are using like housing and fishing technologies yeah. that are literally four thousand years old, and you will still find smartphones. Yeah, no, it's and, and you know there won't be plumbing, but there'll be smartphones because that technology has gotten cheap enough that most people can can have some kind of access to it. Now, when I was first in Mexico, that wasn't as true. About five years, uh, sorry, uh, about what year was years that? ago. It's, so I was in Egypt in 2015, and I was in Mexico in 2012. And in Mexico, there was not as much smartphone penetration yet, but it was rapidly accelerating. And when I was in Egypt, I think like the, it felt like prices had gotten low enough that most people could get you know some kind of cheap Chinese phone. You know, you know for, for for an Egyptian, it would be a lot of money, but they can pay it off over time, and that's like their only their only like major bill. Yeah. And you know, and most of these things are prepaid cards, so if you don't, you know, like you you can let service lapse and get it back. But like it's very important for people. Yeah. Um right. and uh what I found interesting about it though is there was also a cultural gap in how people use them. So for example, in Egypt, if you know anything about Arabic, can I swear in your podcast? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please. Arabic's a motherfucker to read. All right? Like <laughs> It's incredibly hard to read, and literacy in Arabic um, is actually, in a lot of societies that speak speak Arabic dialects, is actually remarkably low. Huh. All right. When I was in Egypt, the middle class was far more likely, even if they could not speak English, to read English mm. than they were to read Arabic fluently. All right. They could read. Some, of course, everybody could read some Arabic, but the language of uh, of commerce yep. was like. Okay global was kind of a global pigeon english and this was also true in asia too so when i lived in korea which was in the the turn of the last decade like some english was ubiquitous like so when i went to i had to go to china for an academic conference back then i was a prof and um like i had some koreans with me and so we're going through to through chinese customs and of course since i you know for people who don't know me, I'm white, so uh, everyone assumes I can't speak any Asian languages, which was you know, a fair assumption. Although I could actually speak basic Korean, um, and and uh, so this Korean guy goes up to the to the customs guy, and he doesn't speak Mandarin, and that doesn't piss the customs guy off. He gets pissed off when he doesn't speak English. <laughs> And so, like, I translate for him because he doesn't understand what's going on because he only speaks Korean. And th- that is really rare, even in Korea, to not have some grasp of English. Um, and so I, like, you know, speak to him in, like, really shitty pidgin Korean. But th- the point of the story is, like, English in Asia, it's almost a different language, but it's a language that everybody speaks as a second language, even in places that haven't been conquered by English-speaking countries. It is mm-hmm. it is the language of of... And it's taken on characteristics, actually, in these areas that is unique to these areas. So, like, there's a kind of um, Koreanized English, or we used to call it Konglish, that you speak a lot in in uh, Korea. That if you don't know Korean, if you don't, if you haven't lived there, it's not hard to, for for an English speaker to pick it up, obviously. But like, you don't really know what they're saying either, even though <laughs> it is technically speaking English. And they're using it to communicate. So I, I, what I want to say this, though, that means that there's a culture of it on these smartphones. So there is there is a – the poor people in Egypt – now we're going to jump ahead to Egypt and just give everybody a global perspective here. The poor people in Egypt, for example, generally um, had some knowledge of, of a kind of like Arabic but in English characters, which was interesting. And they read that. And upper middle class people, middle class people, they they actually partook in American and British pop culture straight out. And so there was an interesting cultural divide in English. For I mean, and and uh, and, and dealing with Egyptians, for example, um, amongst Egyptians who were not upper middle class and thus uh, you know had access to British and American education, which was at high demand there. That's why yeah. I was there. They hated Barack Obama. Hated him. All right. 
Um, for reasons that are complicated, actually, um, they, he was seen as a traitor and like wouldn't take a side during the Egyptian Revolution and screw both sides. So everybody hated him. Like, like yeah. I could talk to people who who are former Brotherhood and talk to people who were Al Sisi supporters, and they both hated Barack Obama. And Trump, at first, was super popular in Egypt, mm -hmm. except among this class of of middle and upper middle class intellectuals who were educated. Um, not in America, they were educated in Egypt. They were educated in American and British schools mm. and thus had American and British media as their cultural norms. Mm. And they pretty much thought like American liberals. So it was a fascinating divide where there's, there have been some people who, you know, unfortunately this, is, this talk has mostly been picked up by right-wingers, but mm. who have pointed out that like the cultural elites um, in a lot of places – are basically basically engaged in, to, in Chinese and American pop culture, mm. and more American than Chinese. But you know, and, and and like, and occasionally you'll see like bits of Korean and this uh, these other peripheral countries, but in the circuit come up, and that's what people know, and that sets a lot of people's tone. So you have a pop culture and a kind of media culture where people have developed like, people from all over the world have developed parasocial relationships. And so parasocial <laughs> means like see like faux social relationships, right? With, with American media centers and American politics, but it's totally from the media perspective, Like they have no organic understanding of it. And so it's interesting when I, you know, you'll have a uh, post leftist, I'm going to quote like Amy Therese in America, <laughs> who is from Lebanon and lives in Canada. And I don't think has ever stepped foot in the United States. Or Angela Nagel, who has been in the United States but spent most of her life in Ireland, t you know, feeding feeding American pop culture and drawing conclusions about American culture in general from it, with very little organic knowledge of what's actually going on in the United States itself. Yeah, yeah. And this is also true for like leftists who will just believe. Like I know a lot of. I got asked yesterday actually by a communist, by a, somebody who's involved with the Mandalite party in Sweden, so like a Trotskyist party in Sweden, <clears throat> to write a write-up of what was actually going on in America because these Trotskyists literally believed everything that the DSA and stuff were saying on Twitter. And I was like, you don't understand the United States. That's a very distorted view. Like, and, and, and that distorted view even goes back to Americans in the cities themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will say uh, just my personal experience as an Australian is like I've over like the last couple of years, I really just have sort of tuned out of um, politics in my own country uh, and focused on America. Um, and some of that is obviously like the spectacle of Trump. Uh, some of it's the fact that, you know, like I have I now have like friends who, are, you know, uh, sort of like on the front line and they're like very serious things could happen to them. Um and you know like in the fight and so i care about it for that reason uh and then i and then i also think like you know some of it is this sort of like globalization that you were talking about and um i i think i think that's both good and bad um i think that mm -hmm. you know like i i like you know if you're not if you're not like pro internationalism uh like yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I think I think that's a very bad position to have. Um, you know, probably one that will end up resulting in human extinction. Extinction. Uh, that's just my belief. <laughs> but at the same time, I think that you know, uh, it is dangerous to have it being like the loudest, the loudest voice in the room, and it's setting the tone. Um. That's not good. Well, it's not so much that I, it's, it, to me, it's not even so much that people like are watching American politics. Like I engage in other people in other countries' politics as sport yeah. too. Like, like I follow Canada because you know I um, for personal reasons as well as I find it amusing. Um, I actually really care about Mexican politics and like because I live there. I follow yeah. politics in Korea because I live there. I understand what's going on. In, I kind of, I, I say that, let me rephrase that. I kind of understand what's going on in the Middle East in so much that anyone can because the politics yeah. there are the most yep. complicated yep. insanity I've ever dealt with in my life. Yep. But, um, and I, I say that as a person who literally was in, was be, became an undocumented person in Egypt for about six months <laughs> um, because of weird political changes. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, like, had to 
you know, I tell this story, like the government knew I was there and they wanted me there, but they also didn't want the political pressure of having all this foreign education in the country, mm. but they couldn't, they needed it there too. So they, they, they were doing this double game of like, well, we're going to deny them visas, but we're going to allow everyone to stay, to, to work know. illegally and stay on, I mean, like, on tourist that, visas effectively. It's like basically like you had a better time of it, obviously, but like, that's basically what's like going on with like Im- immigrants in the United States. Like, especially those like who, Oh yeah, for know, sure. Poorly paid. I mean, it, it's why I do, I do a lot of, I don't talk about it on the podcast or anything because I don't want to yeah. endanger it actually, but I do a lot of immigrant activism yeah. and my way into that is I have a lot of immigrants in my family, mm-hmm. but, um, uh, you know, like who, like my uncle married a Korean woman. Um, my, my family, uh, despite the image that people have of the American South, the American mm. South is very racially diverse, obviously. Mm. And my, you know, my family was, my family was very intermarried. Um, uh, so like, even though we were working class and poor and I mean, like I like to, like I was, a, I used to talk about being a half Jew among shit kickers and that's pretty much true. Um, and you know, that probably doesn't mean much to even a lot of other Americans and definitely Australians are, you, but you can kind of get the gist. I mean, I, yeah. you, um, I grew up amongst rednecks, but in an inner, in an, uh, an interracial intercultural interfaith family yeah. in the eighties when the clan was still kind of, I mean, I guess the clan's back, but the clan was in its last dying throes, mm-hmm. um, at the time. And so you know, that, that was my world. And I, I tell people this because I grew up in a very, in, in a very, in a, you know, multiracial family. And at the same time, we still had segregated prom courts and, 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 and a lot of the, a lot of the proms were deliberately kept private so that there wasn't integrated dances as late oh as the nineties. That's, that's. So I, I, I bring this up. Right. I bring this up because when people are like, oh, my God, you know, um, are when people were learning about sundown towns in America from 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 American pop culture. And this included Americans. Mm. Um, sundown towns are towns where, you know, if you're a person of color, particularly if you're black yep. um, and you're there after dark, yep. it, you can be it's you, you, you you're, you're fair game like police won't protect you. <laughs> and those existed when I was alive. Like I knew where two of them were. As a kid. And so, like, this idea that Trumpism was some kind of this reversion back to, like, some pre-civil rights norms was, like, like the civil rights battles were barely won. Yeah. Weirdly, the best time that I remember for race relations was right before the election of Barack Obama. Like, not during it, but before it. Yeah. Um, And... I left two years into the Obama administration and would come back. And every time I came back, I felt like I felt like I was hearing racist stuff that people had stopped saying in the nineties, come back. But it, you know, notice that I said they stopped saying it in the nineties. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It really is like, like it really is just like how it is kind of crazy. Just how much history there is in the 20th century. Um, mm. Like, the fact that both pre World War One, like pre World War Two, and then post World War Two are part of the same century, um, kind of blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, like thinking about the fact that like the Russian Revolution and Mikowski and all that, all that heroic stuff that seems like a bajillion years ago to every leftist was literally only a century ago. Yeah, and like yeah. there are still a few people alive who would remember those people. You yeah. know, like. Yeah. Uh, my favorite weird one is like what was it? The last Civil War widow died yesterday. Wait, American Civil for the United War? States because yep, yep. Because a seventeen-year-old was married off to a seventy-five-year-old man, oh um, and she died yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yesterday. But meaning, like, I think they were married in the twenties. But you know, she was she was in her nineties, I believe. Maybe maybe even yep. closer to hundred. Um, yeah, that's definitely and, correct. But it is totally possible for that to have happened. And like that, yeah. like even that blows my mind, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I yeah. think a lot of like one of the things about the United States in, and since the eighties is people think there hasn't been a lot of history since then, since the fall of the Soviet union. But I'm like, uh, it's not, it's not been uneventful people. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Just cause you know, some Asian Japanese dude is like history's over. Oh man. 
Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna write a book in 1992 that's accurate for all of three years. Um, I mean, I actually, <laughs> I actually, um, so my my uh, one of my parents was a university teacher for a bit, and they um taught, taught like mm-hmm. the humanities, uh, and so the end the end of history was the very first like philosophy text that I ever uh, like really came across. I didn't actually read it at the time, but I remember like reading you know, the cover of it when I was like, like seven or eight. Uh, and I remember being like quite sad because, um, you know, it's, I don't know. It, it, I can't remember the quote exactly, but it's like, you know, the end of history will be a sad time because, you know, the, you know, the, the willingness to put one's life out there for like some, like, you know, abstract goal will be gone. It'll just be replaced with like, you know, simple, like self-interest and, um, you know, the part ca- caretaking of, um, of like human history. I was like, that, that's really sad. Uh, like, uh, you know, I ho- hope, I hope something else happens. And then, um, like 20 years later, I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Shouldn't have thought that. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting is, I mean, it do- that did feel true for Japan and it definitely kind of felt true in the nineties for the United States. But mm-hmm. like, by, I don't, you know, he, Fukuya, uh, Fukuyama had had like after nine eleven he'd already said that was wrong and that was twenty years ago. Yeah, so you yeah. know it's it's it, yeah. it's it's a thing that you know was it's it's myth and it being wrong has outlived um, even its immediate context. Although I will say about that, interestingly enough, I actually think Fukuyama is a much more interesting thinker. Oh yeah, no, than yeah, yeah. that book or his brief flirtation with neoconservatism applied. I mean, he's basically saying that recently he's been saying that, you know, only something like, you know, so- social democratic mixed economy capitalism yeah. will stop, you know, will stop the earth from just being destroyed, which I think is a, a little bit actually optimistic, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it and you know it, it's funny how 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 many of these uh, kind of the 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 kind of center left of the neoconservative movement <laughs> being disillusioned by Bush um, has have have how far rhetorically left they moved. I don't know that it substantially it translates to much, but but you're uh, to go back to our initial thing. I think the Cold War is all over all of this. I think it's all mm-hmm. over. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also interesting the way people understand China and the United States in Cold War terms, even though if you did even a basic economic analysis, you would realize that there's no way that can be true because the, the United yeah. States and China are totally economically dependent on each other. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, less um, so than a lot of right wingers think, but but hmm. both economies there's totally also, don't work without also each other. The fact that, there's also just the fact that, like, this is, you know, a, a struggle basically between, like, I don't know, like, quote unquote, post industrial powers. Uh, whereas, like, mm-hmm. I think uh, my my sort of interpretation of the Cold War is, like, the United States uh, managed to, like, make it out of sort of, you know, industrial capitalism to post industrial capitalism. Uh, and therefore, you know, could, like, just do things that the Soviet Union couldn't. Uh, and then it just, like, fell apart. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm always stuck between the, um, between two analysis of the Soviet Union, which is the non-motor production analysis and the state mm-hmm. capitalist analysis, um, because I found both of them convincing, actually. Um, and <laughs> to, to break that down, um, the state capitalist analysis is that, you know, the Soviet Union was functioning as a capitalist state on the world market and was uh, really run by, like, as a managerial corporation, as as a mm. um, yep. as a country, which I think is, I think some people implied internal to the Soviet Union based off of, you know, the early NEP. And a lot of the first state capitalist theorists are, like, talking about the 1920s in the Soviet Union, even though they didn't really update it. But... Mm. Um, if you look at the, what what it was doing in the world market, it did kind of act capitalistically. Um, it never could it never could get rid of its market function, and you know even if its market function was weird. But then the non motor production is like if you actually look at the way they tried to set up markets and the tripartite three different currencies, three different rubles, <laughs> um, 
you know, all that, all that madness, um, you know, like the, the total, the fact that like you had total incentive to lie in the middle, in the middle tier of the Soviet, you know, political economic spear. So, you know, um, from Brezhnev forward, you just have a hollowing out of the center of the Soviet union. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and actually not so much the top. Um, and, um, and so, so if you try to say it's cleanly state capitalist, you get into some real problems and maybe these, maybe some of these categories don't even really apply anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would say that like, I always find it interesting, right? Particularly when you meet like, you know, massive online RPGers who like to pretend that they can bring back high Stalinist Russia and the United States or something. That people don't look at the fact that like the Russian productive sphere and its hyper, like it, you know, it was doing as well as is capitalism during the height of war communism and up through the fifties, yep, yep. right? It really was, and that was true in South uh, in North Korea too versus South Korea. All these things follow an early industrial accumulation model. And if you look at the early phases in the West, they are more sporadic and slow, kind of like India. Hmm. Um, but they are still, they still have really high, you know, um, production capacity. They, they seem to have really high early nominal, uh, nominal GGP. I don't like talking about real GDP. I don't think real GDP is a thing, but, no. um, and, nope. and all these things, um, and so the what they what a lot of the defenders of like the Soviet Union will miss is like the Soviet Union and 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 North Korea and all that seem to actually follow a very similar pattern, just hyper accelerated and much more and, and more bloody in a shorter period of time. Still, all yeah. capitalist early developments bloody model that that looks a lot like what happened in the West. Just it just instead of it happening over over an entire century. It happened in 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, I mean, I mean, like, my explanation for that is basically, like, well, one is, one is like, obviously, it's just, like, low-hanging low fruit. Like, I know that, you know, the Soviet Union was, like, getting capitalists to come along to, like, just build factories for them or show them how to build factories. And then once you, once you like, hit the part, once you, like, once you basically can't stop copying other people and you actually have to, like, start innovating for yourself... Uh, that becomes really hard. Not just because, like, you know, um, there's, like, stuff around, like... And I'm, I'm not sure how, like, this tracks, because I know, like, Soviet hard sciences were, like, some of the best in the world. But, you know, like, the, the speech suppressions they had, like, obviously had a negative impact on technological development. But then also, you know, you've got the question of how to deploy innovations. Um, and, you know, if you've ever had a conversation with a libertarian... Uh, you know the like debates the there. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, yeah, a libertarian. Like I've had libertarians who said stuff to me, like, you know, capitalism gave us the iPhone, and I can literally go through and show them, like, okay, <laughs> no, actually, the cybernetic theory was from Russia. The 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 touchscreen was from Russia. Um, like what what happened is there was a bunch of like a lot of that stuff was defected and, and went into R and D in the U S military and then was given to capitalists for free. Mm. Like, um, yeah. but you know, that to me, that doesn't actually, that that's not an argument for the Soviet union or it doesn't, it just tells you that the libertarians don't understand yeah. the high level of participation, even in their free market that the government has to have for anything to work. Uh, because I basically, I think, I think this is. I mean, so basically, so, R and D's not incentivized. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm Go gonna, ahead. I'm gonna be real. Free. So I'm actually a filthy mutualist. Um, mm. So I'm actually yeah, I, the I actually worst. Think okay, can be good. Yeah. Um, but I think, um, I think that yes, I think that libertarians like the stories they tell. Uh, like. I, I think again, going back to the Cold War, I think like they're very, um, they're like you know they're very they're very like adapted. We'll say for that context where you know you had certain big bads and you wanted to you know destroy them with facts and logic, and so you lined up your facts and logic mm -hmm. and you know you you punched progressives, uh, which is you know that's cool. Um, sometimes progressives need punching. It's pretty easy too a lot um, of the time, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah. No, I mean, well, no, no, it's just, I was about to say, I think if you look at, like, the progressive arguments of most of the 20th century, it wasn't really hard to just, to, to knock holes in them or to show how they were, like, they would have mutually, I mean, both in left and right, you could be like, well, you have mutually incompatible assumptions here and here, and, like, particularly in America, progressivism... I think partly because it was a kind of common sense for a certain kind of, you know, social milieu and a social class for a long time was remarkably intellectually lazy um, mm. for a long time. I mean, and and so the Cold Warriors actually, you know, even though their arguments were quite bad often, um, they didn't have a hard time punching at a lot of American progressives who would do stuff like try to have their eat try to have their cake and eat it too on the Soviet union and, you know, go back and forth here or that, or had a really emotive politics. It was mainly about, you know, um, the plight of suffering peoples or either that and the other. And that's not that hard to fight like yeah. in, in an actual spear sort yeah. of. Mode. Yeah. I think, um, I think that's like, uh, and going sort of back to, you know, like smartphones and stuff. Um, I think that's just like a general fact about our current time is that like I think that everyone is sort of just being caught off guard by the very uneven but it has nevertheless happened expansion of speech um I think that's going to caught everyone off guard I but I don't know there's probably like you know like uh like people who are really into tech um who like saw it coming but like everyone else I think um uh, I was really into tech and I I most of the most of the people saw it much more optimistically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Only pretty early on that people go, well, some marginal ideas might come back, but really they won't be popular. Like most people are are selectively rational, and I mm. think I actually think you know in non-stressed times that's actually not a terrible assumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, shit. Um, when times are stressed, people flail around. Yeah. And, you know, I saw this in Egypt, too, and I, I saw it in, um, in Mexico to some degree. Like, you, you, you've even been to places, you know, that where, where you have a lot of precarity, even, in, even amongst elites, right? Mm. Um, and you do see cultures of conspiracy and stuff mm. just pop up. And, you know, there's a lot of that in Latin America, there's a lot of that in the Middle East, and now there's a lot of that everywhere. I mean, I think the place that doesn't have that is probably East Asia, and the reason why it doesn't, I don't think it's because of any cultural superiority. I think it's because they're like much more secure. Mm. Honestly, I mean, so, I mean, like I, I don't know that QAnon is sp- spread to Japan, so <laughs> maybe knock on wood there. Yeah, well, esoteric Hitlerism has been in Japan for a while, um, so you know, I. It, there's a couple of things there too, though. So, so there, there's two kinds of stressors, and Japan has an example of of one that I don't think people think about, which is stressors of stagnation. Mm. And then you have, which is sort of what Fukuyama bring him, what he saw as the you know the the end of history's future was was that. Yeah. And then yeah. there are the other stressors, which is stuff is changing really fast, and no one has a handle on it. And in the United mm. States, for example. Um, like there really is a sense in which like, uh, for a lot of the non-urban U S, um, deaths of despair becoming super common. I mean, average lifespan is actually going down. Um, I mean, like, um, it's going up, it's gone up and continues to go up a little by little for minority groups. Um, but for an aggregate, it's going down. So yeah. Um, and, um, and yet there's also the people who are surviving are living longer and longer and longer. Mm. Um, so you have this really warped demographic spread at the upper end where like, I think, you know, you know, um, we're going to have a average age that's going to be up in the forties by the yeah. middle of the century, which is similar oh, yeah, to Japan, no, yeah, but yeah. also, but also, since we have no social safety net and stuff, that's going to skew politics in a very weird way. Yeah. Um, because yeah. there's not like the, the, it, you just frankly aren't as likely to survive if you're, 
into that into that uh, age group it, without a lot of resources and. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and our social safety nets also weren't designed to last that long either. Yeah. So, I mean, one silver lining is that maybe this, you know, encourages, um, creates like a base that will like allow for the necessary like climate refugee migration. <laughs> oh God. Well, I mean, I, I think not to get too hopeful in the whole Earth as a metabolic system thing, mm. but I, you know, I think there is a real sense where that's going to happen. And uh, that's part of the political stability of the global North right now. Yeah. Uh, instability of the global North right now. I mean, that's definitely what's driving stuff in Europe, but it's also without it. What do they have? Like, I mean, I guess you can automate everything, yeah. but yeah. not really. And, yeah. um, I mean, this is, this is where, this is where, yeah, I'm with you on a lot of this because I think we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of climate migration, and um, Canada better be watching its water. I will say that, like, if they think its neighbor to the south won't won't pick back up the War of 1812, eventually they're foolish. Um, uh, but, um, there's like a, there's, there is actually I can't remember. Um, oh, uh, the guy who did Saga. Have you read Saga? It's a comic. Sorry, this is a weird tangent. Yeah. Um, that he did, he did a comic. But I read, about, I know like, Brian. Brian, yeah, cave on. He did a comic about like, yeah, it's like a hundred years in the future, and it's uh, Canada defending itself from um, like engaging in like guerrilla warfare against the United States, like coming to seal its water, basically. Um, <laughs> well, that's a conspiracy theory in Canada that I used to. That, um, both was not as popular when I when I spent some time in Canada as a kid, but like. Um, when um, when I lived in Korea, there was a lot of Canadians there, particularly because Canada overproduces teachers and does some weird things, um, hmm. and so a lot of them get exported to Asia, as you know, good excess um, middle elites do, and um, and so they were they would always you know they're they're always really you know pro like. Korea is one of the actually one of the few places where Americans were like more than Canadians because Canadians are obnoxious drunks, um, <laughs> unless there was a military base nearby. But in general, one of the funny things about about Canadians in in Asia is like people couldn't tell them apart from Americans ever, and so this was a really big sore point for them. And this would often bring up these conspiracy theories about us going to take their water. And eventually, I just decided to embrace it um, because I'm a <laughs> jerk. And I was just like, well, you know, you did sack the White House, so I think it's time to finish the War of 1812 and liberate our northern brethren um, because you obviously don't have the cojones to finally throw off your imperial rule um, oh, yeah. and should have done so. Yeah. Uh, although, conversely, um, uh, until, until very recently, American progressivism had an anglophilia that mm. disgusted me. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, my my joke is the only progressive position that Mel Gibson ever hold, ever held was a hatred of the English, um, but uh, <laughs> which as an Australian, I'll show you who kind of appreciate. But um, um, it, it's it, the, um, the the side effect of that is that there is this weird sort of like, why can't we just join back in the Commonwealth and and all this oh. and. Sometimes oh, it even shows up in anti-racist narratives. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, this this is a sign of American progressive progressive culture that like that that like wants to undo the the you know um, 1776 um, for a variety of reasons. Mm, um, that 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 is wow. Okay. Um, well, I'm not going to say what I want to say, which is what an alt right person would say so yeah what what is that <laughs> uh, i'd call them cocks <laughs> well i mean i think i i've always I, i've always mocked Ameri like american progressives for example for always claiming to go to canada whenever you know a republican wanna and the, one of the reasons why I, I would mock them for it i was like it's easier for a person from the united states to go to mexico mm it's, it, it is objectively easier. There are more Americans in Mexico than there are in Canada. It's not an expensive visa. It's like 200 bucks, as opposed to Canada, which is about 
fifteen thousand dollars, and it's easier to get a job there. And and yet no one ever does it. It's always let's go run. And and frankly, outside of the areas close to the United States, where there are thus cartel wars because of our weird drug laws, mm. um, you know, parts of Mexico are are as safe as America. Parts of Mexico are war zones, but. You know, you can look up which what part is what, um, and I've li- you know I've I've lived around both actually. So, and I would just I would just mock them. I'm like, why don't you ever say you want to go to Mexico? Why don't you? Why is it always? Why is it always like some white ass, um, like you know, country that doesn't even really want you? Mm. Like, yeah. and, and you. Know, you know, and I, you know, I, this is what went incoherent, but it it actually to me belies a sort of, you know, there's there's an under there's both a parochialism and a not so subtle racism, um, in the history of progressivism in America. Um, I mean, I mean, like they're connected to the eugenics, that, right? That I think still exists. Oh yeah, they advocated eugenics. I mean, they, um. So it, what makes it complicated, for example, um, is that the idea of unified racial interest is a kind of modern notion. Mm, so yeah, yeah. in like the, the early progressive movement, you could be – so the progressives were also not the only left force in America. There were the populists who were often also – they were anti-eugenics, and, but they were often anti, anti-immigration. Um, yep. You know, they'd make excuses for massacres of Chinese. Uh, the, the Knights of Labor, you know, are known yep. for that. Um, then you had the SPUSA, uh, SPA, excuse me, which the successor organ in the United States is the SPUSA. That doesn't matter. It's tiny. But the SPA, which was a fairly large organization in the early 20th century, um, that World War I um, and one of the many red scares um sometimes it's called the first red scare but i actually think it's more like the third uh suppressed in america where the socialists you know they could command 20% of the vote yep like eugene debs was actually a real threat to Woodrow Wilson and they were they were crushed and then final, and then and were crushed by two events one of which was you know the imprisoning of debs in world war 1 and the other was actually i had no idea what to do about the russian revolution Mm. And the fact that um, the Soviet Union wasn't was playing a bunch of uh, Zinoviev in particular was playing a bunch of the socialist parties against each other to find one that was going to be most useful for them as part of the common term, and uh, so the communist sorry, and the socialist sorry. split. Uh, socialist parties in America. Mm. Yeah. Okay. There's a huge one. No, 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 no. I mean, like, you said we, like you said multiple socialist parties. So what socialist parties? Oh, there was multiple socialist, but they were tiny. So like. So, like, um, if you what you can watch the movie Reds, which is not actually the best version of this, but it does go into this. Like, because of the because of the socialist party's inability to respond to the Russian Revolution, there are all these split off parties almost immediately. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And Zinoviev right. was basically playing them against each other um, until the U.S. the CPUSA was eventually formed. Um, with which, w- which interestingly was one of those things where like the grassroots membership of it didn't care about what was going on in Russia. They were often doing like anti-racist uh, organizations in the South, actually, and stuff like that. But the leadership was totally immersed in the common turn. Mm-hmm. And when you after after third periodism ends, they basically funnel everyone into the into the Democratic Party. And this is true up and through the sixties. Like you have people in the in the CPUSA talking to the Kennedy administration. <laughs> Uh, under civil rights pretenses, like, you know, like, I mean, true facts. So it's uh, Lorraine Hansberry, the famous playwright, for example, had 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 access to Robert Kennedy um, and was able to meet with him on the Civil Rights Act and was, yeah. you know, famously um, supported by the CPUSA. So I, I bring this all up because, like, basically that collapsed the socialist stuff in America in a way that that you know happened at other places, but not nearly ex- as extensively, and um, it's part of why our politics, I think, is so strange. I mean, we keep on talking about this, and yet also the other thing about uh, when I bring this up when we talk about communication, and all of this, it's also our politics were subject to outside forces and not just big ones mm. early on. So it wasn't just you know you, you know the the large scale movements. It was also like 
small marginal parties trying to pick sides in 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 issues they weren't just theoretical i mean like um some of the american new left parties were they were getting money from china you know and stuff like that and china was picking sides and so like so you can see how complicated this would get just from real po- just from real politic reasons what what is interesting about this is is because there was nothing like social media is is people didn't know this was going on. Mm. Like, you know, like we know a lot of this now because, because the feds were so up in everything (laughs) that actually some of our best histories of some of these organizations is from the released COINTEL profiles. (laughs) Um, And also the Soviet archives. Oh yeah. So, We might get a we might get a similar thing if like we ever invent quantum computers that can crack encryption. Um, so look forward to that. Oh my That's gosh, I, I would I would love to know, for example, when people are being idiots because they're just idiots, and when they're being idiots because there's because there's different kinds of federal agencies from multiple countries involved. Uh, um, you know, I do know, for example, that in the in the U.S. marginal left, there there was a lot of you know, foreign dark money yeah. um, uh, from various governments that, 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 that like, for example, um, at one point, like the Trotsky's party, uh, the SE, the SEP was getting money from Gaddafi um, and this, that, and the other, because, because particularly in our media environment, and I think we'll probably find out there's a lot more that's going on now than we know. And unfortunately, this is fueling a lot of alt-right bullshit conspiracy theories, right? But because there's a certain grain of truth to it, because if I want to cause chaos in America, I can either set up a bot, you know, activist network to do it, or I could literally just back channel uh, activist network some money and let them do what they want to do mm. as agents of chaos. Because, you know, who invented that shit? The, the, the British and the, I mean, the British, the Germans and the Americans were like a number one at that, you know, uh, that's how Lenin got back into Russia, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. like uh, the Germans doing that to, to really mess things up. I mean, so it's not like this is a new a new strategy at all. It's just yeah, social yeah. media makes it cheaper. It makes yeah, yeah. it so cheap to do. Yeah, yeah no. Um, I mean, I, like if I'm a state like, and I can like throw twenty thousand dollars at it, that's nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my like my like opinion of like the Russiagate stuff is like I think you know the the broad outlines are true, and also it's like so what? It's like you know I don't know. It's like the equivalent of being like complaining about like catching a cold. It's like this is just how things. Well, are. Yeah. Like. Yeah, you know. well, that was my response too. Is like uh, unlike a lot of the right wing conspiracies. Yes, I think a lot of it is true. I also think it's always true, and it's on yeah. margin, and it didn't matter. Yeah. Like, um, but like, I mean, you know, Trump, Trump is probably more mobbed up than most people. That's more susceptible to some of this, but like, you know, bots, I mean, like the Russians also are like botting all sides at all times. They just like, it's, it's, it's one of the few things they can do is. Yeah. And probably like most other like countries, I mean, it's like, it's like basic asymmetric warfare. Um, you know, stop, stop complaining about it. Right, I mean, Saudi Arabia, Israel, the EU, they do it too, and we do it to them. And yes, they they get a stink, they raise a stink when we get caught. Yeah. But, I mean, it's more just that we were gauche enough to get caught. Like, yes. yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's, yeah. this is, I, 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 it's interesting how, how in America, but maybe it's worldwide in the West. How there is both a sort of like cynicism about statecraft, and yet people also act utterly naive. Yeah, like yeah, yeah it's it's, it's I, kind of amazing. I, I my conception is, is like I think a lot of people. I don't know, I don't know if this is actually like correct, but but it's like a lot of people take the state to be this sort of like Hegelian thing that's just above us, and it just like does stuff, and like you know it'll just do stuff, right. and it'll do it properly. And I'm like, nah, man. That's not true. Uh, I think, like, even if, even if, like, you're not an anarchist, I think you should be thinking about, like, politics outside of the state. Um, like, if only for the fact that I think, um, and I, I, you might, you might, you might have, like, some knowledge about this, you might not, but I think that, um, 
I think like the way that states and like groups organize, I think is like, you know, you can pretty much see it. it no, it's, it's very like deeply connected to like communication and information processing technologies. And so as they change, mm-hmm. like, of course, these, um, these things are going to change or new, new ones are going to come along or they're going to evolve or they're going to die. Um, and I don't think anyone has gotten a general theory of this yet, because if they did, um, like we, we would probably know about it. Uh, and they'd probably be making quite a bit of money in Silicon Valley giving talks. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I, I think like that, that is how you should perceive things. Yeah, I would. I mean, I, I, I kind of do. I mean, I have a very emergentist view of mm-hmm. the way politics works and it's actually one of my frustrations now. Um, for years, I was always arguing this sort of like new left, quasi anarchist, like the personalist political. I was arguing against that for a long, long time. That was in America. Mm. And I could go into the history of how that developed in the United States and its relationships to like calling out progressive and communist men for supporting wife beaters. And yep. like, I actually yep. think yep. it yep. wasn't a bad move, but people yep. started to like believe it in a way that it was not yep. thought to apply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. There's been a recently there's been an inversion of that since this whole like social democratic awakening in the US where effectively nothing is political but like <laughs> what the working class does and what the state does and that's it. And and that's it's just dumb. it just seems to me like we have a bad habit of like just taking a stupid narrative and flipping it on its head. Mm. Like so, you know, um a lot of people critique uh you know like the the Chapo Trap House kind of socialist for this. Um, and, and, you know, um, they'll blame Marxism for it, but I, I uh, I don't think it's just a Marxist Marxist, flaw. Marxism for like Chapo Trap House, like shenanigans or like people like wokeness. Yeah, well, they'll say that like, like the base superstructure, like I'm thinking specifically of some MMT critiques of this and they'll say, oh, the Marxist obsession with the base is why they don't think anything is political. And I'm like, no, I think it's actually just like, it's literally counter signaling to a, to a left narrative that was dominant for yeah, yeah. literally a generation. Yeah. I mean, um, fr- from boomer progressives until, until about, about when Tumblr got <laughs> made irrelevant. Um, and, uh, so three generations of thinkers have been effectively, uh, reacting to this and so the natural the natural way to counter signal is to invert it and say like only what the working class does when it's acting as an agent or only what the state does is politics and you know that's also frankly fucking stupid but it's it's a natural counter signal you know if you think about social semiotics at all and and kind of bound choices that you would yeah. emerge yeah. um yeah. From yeah. from these subcultures that like inverting these narratives is a nat- is a, an unfortunate natural response, and mm. um, you know you can almost like system theoretic it out <laughs> why people would would go from a, one stupid conclusion to an almost equal but opposite stupid conclusion. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, and. Uh, you, I think, you, for example, um, discussions in America of race and class reduction um, always make me laugh because um, a lot of the class reductionists, in quotation marks, um, don't really have a, a good functional understanding of what class is. And a lot of the race reductionists don't have a good functional understanding of what race is. So, like, it, it's not even what they say it is. It's like, it's more like, no, this is a popular set of discourse tropes it's very that frankly it's very half-assed and one of the things i've noticed about about uh you want to go back to globalization of pop culture Mm -hmm. is more people have access to theoretical frameworks than ever before Mm -hmm. but that also means their ability to be vulgarized and made stupid um particularly in forms that prioritize pithiness um thank you twitter uh is is overwhelmingly, you know, easy to do and probably, I mean, super encouraged by the very kind of engagement that you would. Yeah. So, so more people know about theory and, you know, political economy and can debate things than ever before, but they're also likely to reduce it to like reductio, reductio ad absurdum positions super fast. Yeah. 
mm. because of the, the natural incentives of the communication. Yeah. And also because frankly, people are lazy and, and I don't, and people think when I say that, that that's good. I actually think it's one of the best things about human beings <laughs> is that we're kind of always trying to figure out how to offsite labor and be lazy so we can do other things. And, um, and one of the ways that you can become intellectually lazy that's maladaptive is oversimplifying any mm-hmm. framework. Yeah. I mean, so you, you move it from a theoretical apparatus into a heuristic and then from a heuristic into a slogan. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden it's very effective at communication. That's also very, very wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess, you know, if anyone studies like the history of religion and stuff, we should see, we see this happen constantly all the time. Like, this is not new. Um, I think the issue today is that we're not used to it happening with advanced political theories or whatever. But, you know, yeah, I don't think I, anyone I, would... You know, ideas are not magically susceptible you know, because they have to be of a certain category. Uh, so, yeah, no, that's very... Right, reasonable. exactly. So, I mean, we have stupid Marxism. We also have stupid reactionaryism. I mean, like, oh, yeah, the yeah, fact yeah. that you have someone as a Rudite, as, Al, as Alexandra Dugan, who writes on Heidegger um, and Derrida and, and you know, um, reactionary theory in a kind of post-fascism in a hyper-sophisticated way, going on Alex Jones and being somehow involved in, you know, tangential to things like QAnon, which are basically, you know, blind idiot uh, augmented reality cults um, that you know th- this tendency is 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 uh, I think univocal univocal if anything the left in America and the left maybe worldwide doesn't realize how successful how susceptible we are to it because we are not given to conspiracies as much as we are given to um, under theorized structures that we just throw around. Mm. As yeah, kind of shorthand. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, like, I think, I think, like, a really big problem is just that, like, you know, empirically validating a lot of this stuff is quite difficult. Um, it's very hard to to validate structural apparatuses. You're dealing at a level of complexity that, yeah, you know, I mean, the the human sciences in general, even just for individuals, you're dealing <laughs> at a level of complexity that like confounds most general okay. science. Um, you know, there's a reason why physics is like the, is like the, the science where we have some of the most stable, um, knowledge bases because it's a, one of the easiest to run experiments on and b literally the basis of material being. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, as complicated it is, is, and as mystified it seems to most people, it is literally the, the simplest form of interaction, <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know, when you start thinking about emergence and chaos and all that and, and dealing yeah. with like yeah. the overdetermination, and I mean this in the, in the, in the um, scientific, not in the Althusserian term, because, <laughs> you know, uh, another thing I hate about, about left wing language is particularly from the sixties is this tendency to adopt scientific language and ruin it by using it poorly or, oh, yeah. re, or reframing it in a way that's, that, it's not related to anything. Yep. Um, and it's so like a really right. bad analogy to science. Yeah. I mean, like I'm, I'm not really, but not, I'm actually like not anti postmodernism. Like I, I actually find like people like Baudrillard to be really helpful and helping me mm-hmm. think, but I do hate it when you, when you read something and you get like all too sair over the termination or Deleuze, ribosomic and, like these approximations to science that have nothing to do with science, but also ruin the vocabulary for everybody. So now when I say overdetermination, people think, I mean, this highfalutin concept from Althusser that no one understands. What I actually mean is there are too many possible causal factors to point out a singular cause. Like, and so, so what you have is it, it, so you have a lot of correlative data that you can assume is causal, but isn't. And, um, you know, I, I think like, I don't know, I just have a background in anthropology and like three basic science courses. I can figure this shit out. I don't know why so many other people can't yeah. like, I mean, I mean, like, I think it is. Um, so I, I, you know, um, <coughs> I, I read the back cover of, um, the end of history and then I didn't do anything really just philosophy for about 10 years. And then I picked up and I'm pretty sure you've heard of this guy. Um, Ernest Becker's the denial of death. Um, 
when I was at like yep. the end of high school and um, I was going through some shit. Uh, and that, that was, that was fun. I had a whole fun existential crisis from that. Highly recommend. Um, I actually tell, I, I talk about terror management theory from yeah. that book all the time yeah, and terror management theory and identity. Yeah. And, um, people again, don't know what I'm talking about a lot of times. Yeah. That book is important. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, I think, I think that, um, I think that if like you seriously like sit down and like be like all right so this is what i don't know and then you're like just th- this is what i don't know like according to you know like basic physics like there, there are you know very very quickly we reach like you know f- shit becomes incomputable and then you're like how, how, how do i actually know this because I've, I've never actually you know gone to a physics lab and done an experiment uh I, I'm, I'm friends with some physicists but they could be lying uh the entire journals could be lying and then you then you quickly realize just like how like little uh, actual like solid foundation you have for anything. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah, you can get to an uh, an epistemic crisis really fast once you realize yeah. stuff like, oh, scientists believed in ether for a bajillion years, yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, um, because it made the math work. Like, and, and and like you know, like we're basically right now uh, we're making conservative arguments, um, and I don't, I don't, you know. I think I think that like no, I, <laughs> sorry. Well, conservative arguments often have a certain a certain pool of them because they're based in something true. Yeah, yeah. Their their responses to them is like basically like oh, and this uncertainty, but I can sell you this certainty. Then blah 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 blah. And there is yeah, there actually yeah. is a sense in which I think radical heronic skepticism. You know, like if you think that's what postmodernism was ultimately about, for example. Um, is naturally and is naturally conservative, like oh yeah, yeah. totally. You've um, um actually, sorry, uh, Matt Matt McNannis, who's uh, related to Zero Books, uh, yes. recently published Postmodern Conservatism, which I think is uh, I think is like the best take on Trump uh, I've come across. So ups to him. He's got a podcast. Uh, I listen to it. I, I well, interestingly, I always think Matt McManus is really good when talking about the right and really oh. wrong when talking <laughs> about the left because he has he has basic liberal political science assumptions. Yeah, but his arguments about po- about postmodern conservatism, I started worrying about that even in the when I was coming out of the evangelical um, mm. community when I realized that, for example, presuppositional. Um, Presuppositional apologetics, which was common on the right, um, is actually um, rooted in some of the same language problems and um, epistemological framework problems that, like, deconstruction was rooted in. (laughs) Um, And they know it, too, actually. And so, like, uh, they can invoke that. I mean... um, yeah, but I, I do think there is also a very real sense. For example, like when I talk about this, people will talk about how like string theory or brain theory or dark matter has to be true because of the math. And I'm like, there's all kinds of things we thought were true because of the math. Like I... going back to defending Ptolemaic calendars because the math worked out better because uh... it did. Um, um, to uh, ether. To I'm like you're you could have fundamental frameworks wrong, and that's why the math doesn't work, yeah. and that's why the incomputability becomes a problem. Yeah. Not that you know, I mean you know I often do wonder like is is the whole like you know quantum standard model divide actually a problem, or is it you know like is is it really incomputable, or is it like just our framework is wrong somewhere? Even in something that seems as solid as physics, and all right, yeah, and I say it seems as solid as physics because one of the things about physics is, even though it's the base science, like, I mean, you know, I, I, another example I guess I can get into, and I, I don't talk about this stuff as much anymore, but like, how is string theory not metaphysics? Like, I don't even see how you can disprove parts of it. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> like, there, there is like literally no theoretical, <laughs> like. There's no, like, for some of them, there's no immediate um, practical applications and no falsifiability criterion. Now, I realize falsifiability criterion, for example, yeah, is kind yeah, of a yeah. bullshit way yeah. of looking at science, but, yeah. but like, 
still like I don't have a whole lot of anything I could do. Like I don't even know what the predictable. Like it doesn't seem predictable. It seems it seems to explain things, but you can do that ad hoc. Mm. Um, now leftists don't tend to get that much into theory of science. I mean, like there is a real problem in that when I deal with um, leftists educated in science, they tend to either be not, or they tend to be engineers. (laughs) Mm. And um, my social science brain kicks in and I go, anytime I meet an engineer Mm. um, in specific, like they're like the majority of weirdo terrorists and people who believe really strange shit. Um, <laughs> Have you read, uh, Jeffrey Huff's reactionary modernism? Uh, no, I haven't. But I will add that to my list of things to read. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the reason I bring it up though is that uh, the I think it's the second final chapter is about Nazi engineers. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So reactionary modernism. It might. Not, it might not be published under that in America. Anyway, uh, um, I'm sure so you can. I, I I'll look it up. Pirate. Anyway, whatever. I'll get it. Um, we don't worry about that. But yeah, so I, I think that's. I think I don't say, and I said that not to like crap on engineers. Actually, I think I think what it is is like there's a certain kind of applied model brain. Yeah. yeah. Um, that uh, that that can appear to all, like can appeal to all kinds of political ideologies, but then. Like then, you, then it seems like you don't have a whole lot of people in behaviors of science until you get to like anthropology, which you know I'm from you know my my science education, you know I'm not an anthropologist. I don't have a degree in anthropology, um, but I, I do have a pretty extensive actual education in it um, mm-hmm. because of some another degree that I got for to become a lawyer. Weirdly, <laughs> um, but the uh, the. The issue that you have there is like anthropologists, they can't decide if they're even a science. Yep. Um, <laughs> like, it, like it was literally debated in the American Anthropological Society to take the word science out of the mission statement. Mm. Um, and B, like it's, it's radically different depending on what field that you study in. And so like you, when you meet leftist anthropologists, they tend to be cultural anthropologists, not, mm. not um, uh, forensic or you know, historical anthropologists. Yeah. Right. So, um, so, you know, interestingly, all of all anthropologists also, there's a, you, there's a tendency to be more likely to be, um, anarchist than Marxist. Um, yep. which I couldn't tell you, I, I, I don't really have a structural theory as to why that is, but yeah. it's, you know, like, I think there's like two Marxist anthropologists of note and like oh. everybody else is, you know, either non-political or they have vague anarchist sympathies. <laughs> but uh, there isn't a whole lot of studying of, um, of like, comparative biology and stuff on the left. That seems to scare leftists. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And I think I'm not quite sure why it scares them so much. So speaking for myself, um, my, in, my, like, instinctive response is, uh, you know, it's like, Oh, like what? What if? What if you are correct? Like, what if you can actually justify this horrible shit off biological grounds? Or you know, like what if? What if like you know the conser- like reactionaries or conservatives are right, and like you know, people from different groups like can't work together, or they can't work together as well. It's like it's like statistical, um, and you know, like we might have to mm-hmm. we might have to like concede some ground. Um, and that, that seems like really fucked up. Um, and so that, that whenever like I, you know, thought about it, uh, that, that like was my single response. Whenever I tried to like reason that out, uh, that, that was what I got. And then, you know, I, I came across, Yeah, but, like, but like, that seems to be like a denial of reality though. Yeah. Like, like, I know. So if, if any of the things are true, yeah. and, like, it's just I like. Mean, I mean, one of the things I think about it may may also help explain the confusion is so most of the way you can answer this is there's an is ought distinction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is a way in which Marxist politics in particular, but leftist politics in general, mm. have kind of been in denial about the the is ought distinction anyway. Mm. Um, particularly in the you know early 20th century Marxism, which was like 
communism no. has to happen because it's literally a necessity because <laughs> because the you know Hegelian logic means there is no is ought distinction. Um, it's not whatever is is right, but kind of it is within historical periodizations or whatever. And I don't think like there's plenty of evidence that Marx, you know, and not that you have to defend Marx. Um, and I, I don't defend Marx on everything either, actually. But that he wasn't cons- it, it, at minimum, he wasn't consistent on that thought, on that line of thinking, yeah. um, particularly in his late writings. Um, and uh, but it is it is definitely there, and was definitely a big part of Marxism. Is like, oh well, we don't really have to put you know put forth a, a positive politics. Or we can go wildly between voluntarism and like yeah. hyper determinism, depending on our mood. Because um, there, we don't have to, we don't worry about the azot distinction because we fundamentally reject it, um, and I think that sort of that is sort of thrown throughout um, leftist thinking. And I also think, um, and this was not originally a leftist position. Interestingly, it was more of behavioralist <laughs> and capitalist, but it's become a leftist position. A tendency towards um, you know the view of of alt of of there's no such thing as human innateness mm. um ever and everything in social construction is voluntaristic um mm. and you know i i when i really study anthropology i don't even know how you parse the social and the biological separate from each other totally yeah, yeah like mean, we're a social animal like yeah. how do you yeah. even change that like and i I, I have pointed out that that's not Marxist position, but it is a position Marxists have taken since yeah. the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, and that, that's how you get, that's how you get yeah, to yeah. the strands of primitivism. Yeah. Well, whew. um, yeah. Well, you know, are people who are, who like almost have social construction. It's not of our understanding of reality, but of reality itself. They basically believe in magic. Uh, this is not a problem in Marxist circles, but it is a problem in like anti-imperialist anarchist circles where, you know, mm. it's like you can't tell people their magic is wrong. And I'm like, well, it's wrong. <laughs> like, y- y- <laughs> like yeah. uh, there's plenty of, uh, of social frameworks and stuff. I totally cannot tell them they're wrong and there's no way to adjudicate between it. But like, yes, no, like sympathetic magic doesn't work. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> For anyone, and it's not like we haven't had it in the West as part of our culture in the past either, so come on. And it's also not like, yeah, there's a bunch of weird assumptions that happen in that. Like, there's an inversion of Eurocentrism that also, like, pretends like there hasn't been scientific thinkers outside of the West. Oh, yeah, no. (laughs) And and that Western science is just a cultural imposition. It's just such a strange way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, uh so uh, actually a good book on this is um profits P- profits facing backwards uh which details like reactionaries in india picking up postmodernism to like defend their reactionary beliefs and like people from lower castes oh yeah uh embracing science uh and rationality to like you know do so- like social movements against them um Mira Nanda is actually awesome on this and awesome on the Western misunderstanding of this. Um, yeah. Yeah. and has been for a long time. Like that's not the only book by Mira Nanda that I would suggest people read. Unfortunately, um, Mira Nanda is often associated with new atheism, which now everyone uh, in, in the United States thinks is inherently reactionary because of the, because it's, you know, with the exception of Daniel Dennett, they all ended up being inherently reactionary, yeah, yeah, yeah. which I remember saying at the time, but it had nothing to do with atheism. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, no, they're just sneaking in all these, you know, yeah. positivistic bullshit claims. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say, Go ahead. Um, uh, I have, uh, one of my Twitter friends is like pretty into the um, atheist scene, and apparently, um, well, well, I'm sure you'd know this actually, but like, uh, you know, Surpri- unsurprisingly, like most atheists are like, you know, basically like Bernie Sanders supporters, um, when you poll them. Um Right. But there's a view that, but there's a bunch of very loud ones that are yeah, all, yeah. that are almost alt rightist. It's yeah. it, it uh, I is mean, I, I would say I would say like that yeah. that that feels like more of like a twenty sixteen thing, uh 
to me. But yeah, I, I, I think that's still like the assumption. I think I think it went away very fast. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I think those people were shut out of the movement very, very quickly. But that perception yeah. has remained on the U.S. left. I mean, like, there. You, one of the craziest debates that I've seen online was literally is denying is denying anthro, uh, astrology sexist. <laughs> yes. By left, like, oh, and I was right. just like, you know. I was like, this is where we've gone. And and the funny thing is, is postmodernism is not really a problem on the American left anymore. This isn't even postmodernism at all. This is, this is basically, I mean, I I think it's basically like standpoint epistemology, which is not truly a postmodern theory. You can actually blame it on Marxist. (laughs) And I know Marxists who hate that, but I pointed it out. Like, um, it goes back to Lukash's reading of Marx and like, um, and uh, I, unfortunately, um, a, a lot of people at Kuwait and all those all those things in the United States, um, we don't link those with postmodernism. But oh, but yeah. it has led to some very weird, like your belief structures and irrational things are, you know, like you need to believe in certain irrational things not to be sexist, racist, etc. Now I say this as a person who a I am personally. Um, non-theistically quasi-religious mm-hmm. and B um, I take religious studies and all that stuff very, very seriously oh, in yeah, ways yeah. that you atheists you you in general should. didn't. Yeah. And you totally should. Um, but I, I find some of this stuff to just be hilarious. Like particularly stuff like reading, reading the American Muslim community back on Muslims and uh, in, in, um, in the Middle East are in Europe. Like, mm-hmm as proxies for one another. Cause that's totally not accurate at all. Like, and I can tell you this from personal experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. And, um, but American leftists don't really, I think they don't want to deal with it at all because to, I remember once, for example, I made an argument against race realism that took genetic, um, genetic population drift seriously. Mm. So for example, I would talk about how, uh, there's stuff like there are genetic traits that we can track and track the populations. None of them map to race at all. Mm. And I got told there were a, a category of leftists, some of which this was personal, but the, some people picked it up that since I took genetic determinism seriously at all, that I was making apologia for race realists and thus was really a race realist myself. <sighs> yeah. Like, and I'm like, no, literally, if you look at human, the human genome, that is the best killer of, of race as anything but a social construct because morphology doesn't match to phenotype and, and phenotype doesn't really match to genotype. Like, and if, if you looked at population genetics, I could prove it to you. Yep. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's also, um, I don't know if you know this, but, um, and this is again, another tangent, but, um, I've I've like I I've been reading some well over the last couple of years I've read some books on um like you know developments in evolutionary biology and like there are there are people coming out being like yeah you know like like Darwinism and like selection uh once you get like you know like large multicellular creatures like starts to matter less and less just because like you know they're so adaptable that um like you just need to get like roughly the right environment um so right like you, you know like that that like really undermines like a lot of reactionary arguments about like survival of the fittest and stuff and yet you know i haven't really seen anyone talking about this um which is a shame well because you know, they're not familiar the only thing i've seen talked about in left-wing circles from biological science is everyone getting a boner for epigenetics because it makes the Marxist exception with Lamarckianism look like it was actually accurate? Uh, yeah. um, you think? You think, uh, you think because you know, if you read like, sorry, uh, you, you go ahead and then I'll. No, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, you like, you, no, well, you know, I, I would think anarchists would would pick it up. Would, I think they would because you know, anarchists are more interested in anthropology. Well, I, I was also gonna say like, you know, like stuff like um, you know, animal cooperation and stuff. Uh, and intelligence because of like Kropotkin. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Marxists are, are, are historically have insisted on the, on the uniqueness of human beings. 
mm. um, as part of its dialectical structure. And one of the things that I've pointed out is, you know, they would say that labor or social organization was the, what's unique. But I'm like, man, you got labor and social organization with beavers. Mm, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I was I literally I'll, watching uh, a video today. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, you go on, and then I'll make my point. No, I was just like, I was literally watching a video today about about why certain beavers died out, and it was because um, the the dam building beavers were were able to alter their environment in ways to maintain their habitat in ways the other species of beavers were not. Mm. Um, and so the idea that that kind of labor envi- environmental altering is totally unique to humans is just frankly false. There's, yeah. there's it's just not true. Yeah. Are you familiar with uh, the self-domestication hypothesis? Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, there's, oh, I can't remember who, but someone someone wrote a book saying that um, it was um, like <laughs> this is. I I I I think they're like this is a hypothesis, but um, I I want it to be true. But they were like um, it was the evolution of language that allowed like people. Well, complex language because obviously some animals have like a very rudimentary form of language, but it was it was what allowed like people to like you know coordinate together behind the backs of like alpha males and then kill them, and then 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 that over the course of like hundreds of thousands of years uh, was a selective breeding that like bred those traits out of humans, and that's why like where that's how we self domesticated. Which I don't know is I don't know if it's true, but I want it to be true because it'll make reactionaries really, really mad. Well, I, you know, I, I am a firm believer, and it shows up in my poetry. But I actually believe this anthropologically mm. that language was invented to hide things, not to communicate. Because if you understand how humans communicate, um, verbal language is the only way we can easily lie. Right, Most yes. of our other language forms, we don't have enough control over to, and we, and we use them. And like, if anyone has dealt with the way people act on the internet and why people have anxiety and stuff, it's because like, there's so many other language inputs that it's shut off from. And it's not just like tone, like yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, communicate yeah, yeah, yeah. broad spectrumly with your body. So like, but it, it's very hard to lie with that. You have to train yourself mm-hmm. to lie with your body. Like it is not easy to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but it ain't that hard to lie with language. And so, yeah, I mean, I think I have, I've always bought that. I also, I also am a subscriber to the, self, to, to the, to the self-domestication thesis and that I think it's a good thing. I think that's actually yeah, probably yeah. why we survived when some of our other hominid friends did not, <laughs> um, is because, uh, the inquisitiveness and in brain, you know, and brain development and brain plasticity yeah. is an adolescent trait. That in self in if people know domestication theory, domestication of animals increases the manifestation of of adolescent traits for much much mm-hmm. longer. Um, and if we self domesticated, we have a lot of adoles- of adolescent traits that you. Yep. And if you compare us to chimpanzees and bonobos, bonobos have a lot more anal- uh, adolescent traits than chimpanzees do, and. Um, you know, and so do we, although I, I'm also a believer that basically we're a weird species that has both tendencies, hmm. um, both the chimp tendency and the, and the bonobo tendency. So we can be friendly and, you know, sexual pair bond and, and negotiate. And we clearly do this. Um, yeah. and then also under stress, we become murder machines. Yeah. Um, so yeah. like our chimpanzee friends, yeah. um, you know, but also chimpanzees can be domesticated and, you know, they're not always murder machines. Yeah, no. Um, um, I, but, yeah. I, there's like but, an anecdote uh, from Franz Duval, who's like, you know, a primatologist. Right. Really famous one about how uh, I think, you know, like he was going away and, you know, he was looking after, you no, know, like in, uh, you know, enclosure with a bunch of like his chimps and there was one that were like, you know, he had really good friends with and like he talked about how it like it hugged him before he left and you know well it was on one hand really touching and sentimental on the other hand he's like yeah like you know if this if this animal wanted to it could like tear me apart at any time yeah i mean that's the thing like like um for example another uh famous example i don't know if it was the wall but it's another primatologist i was i was listening to tell me like they lost a finger because a um a bonobo was trying to warn them and bit them. Oh no! And 
its jaw power took that finger right off. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, um, and, and we, uh, one of the things about humans, and this is one of the things that I think, um, one of the things I think leftists actually kind of, uh, you know, Marxists, uh, Kropotkinists and stuff kind of inherently understand mm-hmm. is and it's almost dialectical and expression, right? We are kind of the weakest ass ape. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like we are physically weaker than most other apes. Um, maybe all other apes of comparable yeah, yeah. size. Um, and yet because of the, our ingenuity in light of that very fact, mm-hmm. we're the most dangerous primate. Yeah, no. Like, we, you know, we, uh, we wipe out whole species really nearly. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, and it didn't even take, um, like, you know, we didn't even need like advanced technology for it. Like, you know, if you look at, um, like what, like, like, uh, large mammals started going extinct when, like, yeah, we needed extinct. language in the addle addle. That was all we needed. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I mean, um, it, it is amazing. Like, one thing is, like, we, we have this massive destructive power, and I was like, we had this massive destructive power with sticks. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> because of social organization, we figured out how to chase whole herds off of a cliff with sticks. Of course yeah. we would figure their stuff out. I mean, yeah. it does, it is weird. I mean, you know, when you think about the development of human sciences, my other favorite fact is we were splitting the atom for 20 years before we figured out the Heimlich maneuver. Like we're mm. a strange species, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, Which is crazy, we, right? Like, we, we figured out like <laughs> wheels on the bottom of suitcases in like the nineties. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, like, like we've had wheel technology for I don't know ever, but <laughs> I mean human ingenuity. This is one one of my arguments when when Marxists get very lockstep and like, well, it has to be this way, this way, and this way. And I'm like, yeah. uh, no, it doesn't. Have you ever seen how stochastic and weird scientific development is? Because like, like we yeah. can all develop like cathode ray technology at the same time, and yet we won't figure out what to put a wheel on, like. It's very strange. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I guess this should give you anarchist your your father when arguing with Marxist online, and I, I guess as a good Marxist, I shouldn't give you this, but it's if you're trying, you know, trying to be scientifically literate, this is something you have to do. And the one thing I'll say about um Marxist discussion of science is they tend to be obsessed with Soviet Soviet um philosophy of science from like the twenties. Oh. And 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 then like now and they drop everything in between <laughs> it's it's kind of funny uh, yeah um dodge that lysenko um yeah D- dodge lysenko because and also like lysenko wasn't a little marky and even though he's kind of started that way so we mm. can save ingles that way i know epigenetics means lamarckianism wasn't totally wrong except epigenetic except the epigenetic manifestations are not what you're saying they are they're not like it's not like you cleanly pass traits down in adaptive ways. It makes sense. It's a lot of it has to do with genetic noise and protein markers and yep. and gene manifestations. That some of which are adaptive, some of which are not. You know, like you know, leftist. You know, le- politicized readings of science tend to be shit. Like it's not. Yeah. I, I'm coming down on leftist because that's what I know. Yeah. But like you know. It, Reactionary reappropriations of science are often hilariously oh, yeah. wrong too. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I I completely um, agree. Um, you know, like like um like what is it the my favorite one? I'm Arnold from the Fight Like an Animal podcast talked about this yep. one too, but I'd realized it years ago as well. Like the 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 whole like racialist different breeding strategies, and I was like, oh, yes. you realize that. <laughs> You realize that, that a difference between one and six kids is not actually a huge enough breeding strategy difference to actually matter evolutionarily. Yeah. <laughs> like, also, also, like, like my mom, my my mom had like you know like five siblings, and she's like incredibly white. So shut the fuck up. Yeah, it's like um, Mormons have tend to have four kids or yeah. more. Like it's you know. They're yeah. pretty white. Um, yeah, well, so, like, this is not a racial breeding strategy. It, yeah. it is a difference, actually, between income and, and urban rural tensions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, In fact, it's, but, it's, you know, it's like whatever. a I mean, strategy based on, like, economic prospects, which you claim to know all about. And right. You don't. Interesting. 
Yeah, and 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 it's a re- and it's also on margin difference. It's not even a reproductive strategy that would have any that much evolutionary effect because bride wide breeding is like having a hundred and fifty kids mm. and not raising any of them and let you know like like seahorses. It is not the difference between one and six or one and eight. Yeah, yeah. like um, <laughs> it's just. It, 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 I, you know, like it, it is, it is a laughably bad argument if you know yeah. anything about biology. Yeah. Um, but you know, since most people don't, I mean, another another favorite bad, but made by less reactionaries, not racist ones, but is like the market works like the market is efficient because it works like Darwinism. And then you have to point <laughs> out one Darwinistic fitness is stochastic. It actually doesn't. It is not teleologically coherent. Like what is what is fit in one environment can immediately become unfit within a generation. And two, ninety nine point nine percent of all life is unfit to survive. And so, if you're saying that that's how we should run the economy, you're basically saying that like we have a we we are willing to accept a failure, an economic failure rate of almost a hundred percent. Like that's funny as an argument for economic efficiency, you idiot. Like, you know, you don't really understand evolution if you're saying, or, or, or economics, if you're making those kind of um, claims. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you did, bad, also, the bad stories we like, tell ourselves to go to sleep. You know, go to, if, if you, go to if sleep. you run the economy like that, you also probably shouldn't, like, have anyone talking to each other ever. Because, you know, you, you want, like, entirely genetic, not um, horizontal transfer of information. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so yes. Yeah, so you have to you have to stop all 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 collaborationism because we know where that's going to go. I mean, yeah. like it'll lead to it'll lead to um, you know information asymmetry, and then and oh oh we don't it doesn't work like genes anymore. Um. Yep. So you know, and the best way to keep information symmetrical is for no one to have any of it. You're completely, <laughs> you're completely right. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, there's there there's that there's that funness, um, which is yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting though, right? Because right now it seems, we've been talking for an hour, and it seems like we're a thousand miles away from from you know any sort of politics, and yet I don't see how you talk about human politics without without some basic understanding of the way sociality works i mean yeah. even you know I, lately i've been trying to get people to grok that there isn't really a separation on a deep level between economics politics and culture like that these what? things are they're not the same <laughs> but they're not really different either and because you know they're all tied into biological sociality and you know the way we construct that right and like and like, yeah, this seems to be very hard for people to understand. We just, we just like, need to draw because it like, messes up their their narrative categories. We just need to draw like, you know, just like cybernetic feedback loops, and then like just get like a lot of like feedback, like a lot of you know circles, like you know, feeding back onto themselves, and you just get larger and larger circles, and then you put like st- text over it, and you just like just read this. If you don't get it, just go back and read it again, and you just keep on doing that until you know you get it. Yeah. yeah. Well, people don't understand. Like, I have, crit- I, you know, I have some critiques of cybernetic theory, right? But like, people don't understand why I consider it so important to a lot of the problems we have, um, not just in Marxism and socialism, but like in general yeah. about you know weird uses of conceptual drift, understanding systems with individuals without like doing this weird thing where you deny any human agency. Like, yes, I, we can get into stupid philosophical debates about counter-causal free will, but you know what? If everything is that determined, then, then me not believing in free will is also determined. So shut the fuck up. Like <laughs> also I realize that you, you can't shut the fuck up because you're determined to be obnoxious forever. Um, but you apparently don't realize that, but you're determined. Not really. So like, it doesn't matter it's literally a non-starter question to a, to a like because like well we have to change the way we deal with the way we deal with crime because of human agency being you know being determined and I'm like you know that for that to matter we would have to agency would have to be meaningful otherwise we're just going to, like you can't intervene in a totally caused concept loop 
Yeah. Like, idiot. Like, if you're right, you're wrong. Yeah. Um, um, you know, and I know that's a reductor ad absurdum, but unless you're, like, I, I am sort of actually, like, a, a compatibilist. Like, I think oh, there's yeah, no, something yeah. meaningful to agency. Correct. It's correct. Like, like, I think there's something meaningful to agency, but no, we don't have a council of causal free will because, like, nothing, like, that would be weird. That would imply, like, uh, that would imply that there's a self cause anything. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, anyway, um, but, but you do have to account for human agency and also account for systemic development and, like, both total humans, like, free will, super agency, total, like we have total humanistic control over society and thus we can reorder society in any which, which way, um, which is, you know, sometimes a Marxist position. And this is also, it's inverse is also sometimes a Marxist position. There is no human causal agency. Everything is systems and ideology, which is scientifically and Brandon, like, you know, there's no way out of that. I, I, to me, both those are non-starters. Yeah. And yeah. again, this they're common assumptions of the <laughs> oh boy uh, a radical centrism <laughs> that means a lot of things man <laughs> yeah. so yeah and that's also why like when i come up marxism and stuff a lot of people think i'm a hyper-orthodox marxist and then a lot of hyper-orthodox marxists think i'm crazy <laughs> because i take stuff like game theory seriously and uh. like i'll argue about like the, the the tendency of the rate of profit to fall cannot be a law because it's a tendency. <laughs> like, like if there are countervailing, if there are multiple countervailing tendencies that which you cannot totally map, yeah. and you clearly can't because you've been wrong in these predictions over and over and over again about the final crisis, um, then you do not have a law. You have a tendency, mm. and a tendency has mm. things that that stochastic effects. And non stochastic effects actually that can offset the the tendency, like meaning you don't have a hard rule of motion, and also like analogies to social science to nineteenth century physics is probably not the greatest way to think about social science. <laughs> um, so, you know, like like the laws of motions a la Newton had to be modified too to be true, yep. even though they were more or less true, like. <laughs> yeah. like, come yeah, it's on like true um, sp- specific re- resolution yeah and and like you, you talk about you talk to Marxists about that you talk to Marxists about like analogical models and they get really mad <laughs> it's just like <laughs> I'm like you know the base and superstructure is an analogical model that does not mean that it's just a metaphor you can do anything with but it's it also it's not the same thing as an objective fact and that's true for any analogical model, including like our model of the atom. Like, yeah. um, you know, and trying to get Marxist because I don't know, I feel like, you know, a lot of Marxists don't come out of a background of having a lot of understanding of, of sciences. And then, you know, they come at it from a philosophical position and like try to jump into the philosophy of science, like with no mm-hmm. science background or with a very, Specialized science background. And to be fair, um, to, this is a problem with all complex theories, and particularly in our current economic situation. We are encouraged to be specialists in such a way that you, you, you have a hard time making general enough arguments to do a lot mm. of this. I think the, 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 the hyper-specialization is a lot of what leads a lot of Marxist theory and a lot of leftist theory in general to be, for example, to mistake historiography for history mm. um, and typologies for, for facts and and stuff like that and you know that that is de- highly deleterious to to thinking but you know if you're not making knowledge claims or whatever i don't think it affects your politics on a day-to-day basis hardly at all um which you know which you know but to have to to really go into politics like we're doing right now you have to be yeah. you do kind of have to be um read in so many different fields that it, that you know, at least with a, you know, a, what I like to call a three, a three good book understanding, um, that most people can't, can't do it. And I will say like, this is, this is where, this is where I sort of like almost become a democracy skeptic. Right. Cause I'm like, mm-hmm. in our infinitely complex society, how can I have a society where people 
are both specialized enough to do specialized labor, but mm. are generalized enough to make rational decisions in fields democratically, which I think people have the intelligence to do, yeah. but only if they have any incentive to yeah. have that kind of knowledge and who has the incentive to know that many different things to run a complex society. Like I do get into the, like the, the, the whole almost again, almost conservative argument about, over complexity and civil and, and civilizations and it leading to like all kinds of systemic collapse, which is where my like dark, when I go, when I like give up on Marxism and become like an even condone, like, like pessimist of like, of, you know, of social cycles. That's, that's, I, I do admit that like that, that um, technological and sociological complexity does, does sometimes make me a little worried about yeah. left politics. Um, yeah. But then again, again, conversely, because I like to argue both sides, it also makes <laughs> me think that maybe um, that, that maybe um, maybe a post-capitalist non-representative democracy um, where you where more parts of life was truly democratized, maybe it would, people would be incentivized to actually not be stupid on a lot of different subjects. Mm-hmm. Because right now you kind of we both yeah. don't have time. And also have no incentive for, for most people to be generalists. There, there really uh, isn't you, uh, an incentive to do that. Are you familiar with the work of Eleanor Ostrom? Yes. Yeah. I am. Yeah. I, I think I think like I think her arguments around democracy and what it looks like, I think is like the best argument for democracy I've come across. I mean there's some object there's some objective good arguments for democracy. Like autocratic systems tend to have more like um, food failures and whatnot. So there, there's that. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. but I do I, – I also, you know, I have Ostrom in my head in one end and then, you know, the rise and fall of complex civilization in the other. Yeah. Um, so uh, – um, but yeah, yeah the, the Governing the Common, Commons book is a really good book. Yeah, um, and, and more leftists should, should fucking read it. God damn it. Well, well why uh, – again, why do, why do you think that not – why do you think a lot of leftists don't read it when it's a book that arguably like like – Almost um, both anthropologically and um, and almost statistically proves that a lot of leftist organization stuff actually does work. <laughs> it's like we're not interested in proving that we can actually do this. <laughs> like yeah. we're I just mean, interesting I mean, in asserting that we might be able to. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the obvious answer is like, um, didn't she? Uh, isn't she like related to George Mason University, which you know has a very uh, libertarian uh economics department um i i i I know that you know like she is seeing like a lot of uh libertarians and self-describing neoliberals are like yes which which i think actually is good um i mean uh uh, ostrom you know ostrom's work is is interesting and i'm cool i'm cool with a lot of these you know ideas becoming more broadly popular. But I mean, like if you were to combine mm-hmm. Ostrom with like Michael Hudson's, you know, theories of imperialism and monetary forms and Graeber's work on primatology mm-hmm. and debt and all that. Um, and, you know, uh, sur- sur- you know, surplus accumulation leading to social hierarchies and um, offsetting, like these things are actually to me really, really important. Even if you're not an anarchist, like you, yeah, you sure. really do need to understand this. Um, and you know, I don't really. I, why do we need to have like the fiftieth debate about Althusser? And you know, <laughs> and I say this as a person who literally has a side job where I don't talk about the stuff I'm talking about with you, but I talk about the history of Marxism and and anarchism and this very like, let me show you how things have always been fucked up. But then, like, why are we having the same debates? Because, frankly, the rest of the world really has moved on from some of this. And yeah. even if we keep the basic frameworks, we need to know how and why the rest of the world moved on. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, even if, like, Marx is right about this, well, there's this whole other dimension of human, of human sociality that it would be very good to incorporate some of this knowledge about. Yeah. Um, instead of, like, still debating... Like Marxio Freudianism, like <laughs> you know, and I'm not an anti Freud, you know, I'm not anti Freudian or anything, but like, come on, we 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 we, there's a lot more to science than that. Like, yeah. Yeah. we don't have to just be stuck. 
you know, I used to complain about this when I was in, you know, when I was a paleo conservative in literature, I used to, I used to literally say this all the time. Um, uh, why is it that political and, and literary theory is where bad philosophy goes to die or to be a zombie for 150 years? Like, it's like, you know, it's like the grave, the graveyard of science and philosophy. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, like, um, but I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess it's a very frustrating point to start to write up on, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I was getting that. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Uh, you know, this is so we started everything. talking about American politics and we ended talking about how everyone's a scientist, like most politicos are scientifically illiterate in ways that I actually do think matter for their politics. Like, oh, yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. and I think it matters for their political theory, too. I mean, one of the things that I, I do think, for example, like leftists not understanding in-group, out-group distinctions and stress factors and um different you know innate incentive differences between regions and all this leads to a moralizing politics even amongst people who claim they're not doing it that is utterly unhelpful mm-hmm. like you like i don't think shaming people is going to get rid of systemic racism for example like 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 it might work on individuals if they're liberally inclined but on a society-wide level, that's not going to get you hardly anywhere. Um, and I think we see plenty of evidence for that right now, oh, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, I will say this. I will say this. I think that I think mm-hmm. you're right. I think that you know. I think that everyone listening to this, regardless of their persuasion, should take away that we don't know a lot, and that's that's pretty scary. But, and this this is like one thing that is the optimism that I cling to, no matter how bad things get. I think there's a lot, a lot of low hanging fruit, um, and I think that you know it, it might be hard to like harvest it, but I think that you know we can. I think that we can do a lot more uh, than we think because we've left a lot of stuff like lying on the floor, or sometimes even in our pockets. Yeah, well, I think for, when it comes to like climate change and all that. We're both in dire straits, and you're completely right. There is also a lot of low hanging fruit. <laughs> like mm. it's, 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 uh, it, it's kind of amazing to me how we've gotten into both an overcomplication and then an over individualized view of this. Where I'm like, well, some of this stuff is actually not that hard. Mm. Like, um, like one of the things I talk about is you want to get rid of of a lot of the problems between city and country you know, encourage, uh, density in the country. And believe it or not, um, there are places that have done this just because I had to, Korea has done it. Like Korea is mm-hmm. one of those places you can go to the countryside and you see high rises. Right. Yeah. And like little community, little, like intense, little, like small urban communities, um, in a rural environment because there's not enough land because the North has cut it off and it's yep. a peninsula um, and it's a bunch of mountains, and it has to be pretty productive um, to support its population, even with a bunch of imports. So they structure, you know, they, they encourage density of of housing and of and of zoning, even in areas that in the United States we wouldn't do it. Mm. And like reducing, I actually think reducing um, the food divisions between the urban and rural. And um, increasing population density while also allowing people to have the benefits of, of, you know, access to land that you don't get in the city. And I I mean that even just like going outside and enjoying, Mm -hmm. you know, enjoying nature and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not really that hard to do and would have a massive effect on our efficiency on rural urban tensions Mm -hmm. um, on on a lot of this, um, reducing suburbanization and suburbanization, I think is yep. in general, just bad. Yeah. Um, yep. like it's the, it's the worst compromise between the, between the urban and rural, like, um, um, and, and it's, it's not even something that I could, you know, 
like uh, the new urbanism, which was possible, which co- possible in the arts. I see that as possible everywhere. Mm-hmm. But what we saw with the new urbanism is it became it, it made cities attractive again and thus regentrified them and pushed mm-hmm. and pushed yeah. poor people into the suburbs. Yeah. Um, and, and also has like increased even more hostility between the rural and urban sector. And like that's not really that hard to fix. It really isn't. Yeah. yeah. Like, especially like, because like it's it, all, you it, know. it it. it it's not like a leftist issue. Um, you could probably get like pretty broad support for it, I imagine. Yeah, you could. I mean, and another thing that I think you get part support, for, uh, pretty, like that progressives and communists and whatever could get support for is also like increased urban food production to end mm-hmm. things like just f- like food deserts, mm-hmm. like where there's just shitty, f- like you you have like eighty five Seven Elevens and no grocery stores. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. in in, ur- in urban environments and with people who don't have cars and which is a fair amount oh, of yeah. poor, urban poor people, right. they, they don't really have, you know, a lot of good food options and like stuff like that. I mean, this is reformist stuff, you know, from the Marxist perspective, but it's actually like oh, social yeah. engineering stuff yeah. that isn't hard. It yeah. is not yeah. as hard as people make it out to be. Yeah. And, and you know, nutrition, I mean, nutrition, nutrition is a fucking big deal. Like a oh, huge like um it's one of the it's one of those big deaths of despair slash Mm. you know uh nutrition's tied into that so much um yeah oh god i mean one of the things i did point out with in covid for example when covid hit i was like like socialized medicine actually wasn't to tell if you fucked that up or not Mm. there were other tells um i mean you know the uk has socialized medicine it screwed up almost as bad as the united states um and, uh, you know, and so, and China weirdly doesn't have a socialized medicine section as people think it does, which is also hilarious. Um, cause most people, most people don't know that much about how China's actual internal economy works. Like doctors are poorly paid and mm. I mean, it was actually liberalized in the eighties, like extensively. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, but they do have a command economy, <laughs> despite the fact they don't really have a strong social medicine sector and we're able to handle this a little better, um, a little better after initially really messing up, but you know, so I don't want to, there is a tendency in both the left and liberal circles in America to romanticize the Chinese response, Mm. but, um, they did do better than we did. And again, some of this is not super large hanging fruit to socially organize. It really isn't. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, and like, yet. Um, I mean, like, one of you know, as as an anarchist, like, one of the most inspiring, um, like, f- f- like responses to COVID, in my opinion, was um, was the people of Hong Kong, who you know, obviously, like, they're not ideologically anarchist, but um, you know, they were at the beginning of 2020, they were both like fighting China in the streets, uh, while responding to COVID pretty effectively, uh like without help from the government of the city. Um, and, you know, obviously yeah. that's like, but don't you that's know that's like a CIA case. plot, Frank? Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the CIA were smuggling <laughs> vaccines, um, which is how they dealt with it. Uh, no, um, you know, I, I think, I think there's like, you know, there's obviously like uh, one aspect to that is like, you know, when you're, when like a group is threatened, um, they'll become more internally cooperative. Um, but also, you know, I, I think I think like, you know, a city of that density, like pulling that off, even if, you know, they did have motivation to do so, I think is like pretty impressive. Um oh, extremely. Um yeah. I mean I you know, I, I think a lot of this stuff has been even in the United States, for example, mutual aid groups and stuff response mm. to COVID early was actually pretty heartening. Um and uh like every major city I know got pretty good aid stuff going on, even yeah. in you know a place as deracinated as as the urban core of the U.S. Uh, pretty quickly. Um, mm-hmm. Was it the most effective thing ever? No. Does it stop you know what you know like all the shenanigans we're likely to have in the next year or two as these protections roll out and people have year like a, a, up to like a year of back rent to pay, <laughs> and and at most. Mm. Um, like six hundred to two thousand more dollars to pay with. Um, no. Um, but 
but it did it did think make things a lot better. I mean, you know, I saw the organization of outdoor homeless encampments um, mm. that were COVID resistant, and you know that's been a problem, right? Because the the shelters in the United States um, are COVID breeding grounds. Yep. yep. And so we already had a homeless problem, uh, you know, and now that's because of because of investment housing and all that. I mean, we have plenty. Like our housing stock is low, but our housing stock is not that low. There's still tons of it unused. Um, it's it. Um, but anyway, so. So, um, but the shelters are not built for that sort of thing. And so they were, they're COVID breeding centers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we've had, uh, very effective, um, outdoor like camps and stuff emerge to deal with it. And, you know, I don't want to manicize any of that, but it, it, it has been better and it slowed the spread down. Um, however, at the same time, we have constant city crackdowns on them in most cities. So, yeah, you know, like. Uh, something like ninety percent of our anti-homeless budget in in Salt Lake, um, which used to have a very like a actually world-renowned homeless program, but that stopped about uh, um, six years ago, seven years ago, under a Democratic administration, I may yep. add. Um, ninety yep. percent uh, um, of our uh, homeless budget now goes into policing. God, you know, like you know, just you know, basically, it's illegal to not have a place yeah. and we shut down a lot of the shelters because they were in downtown and that was wanted for economic development because of California increasing yeah. our housing prices in the entire West. Um, uh, so, gosh. you know, yeah, I mean, you know, stuff like that, fun, 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 fun stuff. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, so you can, you, you know, and so that's where we're at, but, I, but it gives me hope. It also like, it also like makes a certain Marxist over reliance on the state. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Y- you know me. I'm not. Uh, I'm not an anarchist, but I'm also not uh, a hyper statist by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. Um, for example, I keep on telling people that socialism and national uh, socialization and nationalization aren't the same things, <laughs> even in Marx. Um, and it, and like Engels. You know, even in his letters to Kalski when he was endorse, endorsing the Erfurt program, was making a pretty damn big deal about that. Mm. Um, so, you know, my, my reasons for pointing that out is that um, uh, is that there's a lot of like blind statism, even in even in uh, you know Marxist circles, that I think empirically doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. like like. Uh, like the 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 um, the over focus on centralization for efficiency, like mm. for example, they it just, it just pretends like we don't know about you know basic statistical system brittleness from over from over yeah. centralization. Yeah. Like like that we we know that that's that's like yeah like yeah. like the, the more hyper the more teleological centralized something is. Yes, it increases efficiency to a point, and then it becomes brittle, and you have all kinds of systemic breakdown. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like you can mathematically work that out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, my my I, I think my favorite like point on this is um, there's a essay from David Graeber, uh, I think in like twenty you know uh, two thousand and two. Uh, where he's like, yeah, like until you know the First World War, like uh, it was actually anarchists who were like the radical, you know, the the radicals who want to overthrow the state, and like Marxists were more reformists and like doing party stuff. And then World War One came around, everyone was like, well, you know, World War One and the Russian Revolution, and everyone was like, oh shit, like suddenly you know we need to figure out the centralization stuff because like clearly it's a matter of existential survival. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and uh, for both parties, it's it's uh, yeah. It's 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 something. Uh, you know, I think um, you know I, one of the things people will get if they listen to a lot of me is me telling everybody they need to read more and everything ever. Yep. yep. Um, yep. And you know, I think in some ways that's always true. Like, yes, you need to read eight more books on nine different things, <laughs> um, some of which are only vaguely related to each other. 
um, like here's this thing on Aquinas and Christian history, and here's this thing on bound choice theory, and uh, here's this thing on math, and 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 by the way, to say anything meaningful about uh, the history of economics, you need to know all of this, and also how um, language was used in ancient Mesopotamian trading systems with paper money. <laughs> Bye. Um, you know, like, and I guess that's super frustrating because it makes it makes understanding political history rather daunting, but um. In a very real sense, though, people do need to get out of their conceptual bubbles. And I don't mean like in the like generic, like, oh, I should read liberals and I should read conservatives. No, you should also read stuff completely outside of your field. Mm-hmm. Like, and I realize there is, there is a time cost to that and opportunity cost is real. So you have to be selective and try to pick the best things to read or listen to or watch, however you take in information. I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, I think books are better than most things, but I'm not totally, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. not. Yeah, totally against that, you know, in every sense of the word. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in general, um, the people need to engage with this, at least engage with it more, even if it's finding stupid YouTube videos right before, before, you know, the corporations make that too hard to do on these topics, you know, um, you know, get, get a VPN and get on some network that you're not supposed to get on in the United States. And, uh, and get that done, you know. Um, so I guess the the imperative here is in this free floating all over the place conversation where we didn't even talk about everything we talked about talking about. Um, <laughs> that people need to learn more and read more in science and uh, read more. And I also think read more in the history. Like I do, I do think um, my fundamental frustration with most science education mm. is that it's not historical enough. And my yep. fundamental frustration with most historical and political education, it's not scientific enough. Like, <laughs> and maybe that's because I have an anthropological bias and, you know, that's a historical science, but like, no, seriously, it, it really kind of is important. Mm. Um, so that would be my, my final takeaway for all. If anyone could follow all the various threads of this very yeah. discursive yeah. Um, way uh, that I go about things. Uh, well, I bet, I bet your students absolutely love it. They they do, but they also absolutely ask me to summarize at the beginning and end so that they know what the hell I was on about because <laughs> they are not used to um, circular discourse patterns um, as uh, opposed to the good old uh, Anglo-American linear one. Uh, um, and I was, well, you know, I always laugh because I'm like, yeah, you know, in, in cultures like Spain and, and, and stuff, people are totally, totally... Um, they totally just talk this way, so yeah. you should get used to it. But whatever. Well, you should, you know, tell um, them that you know this is how it's going to be in the brave new world where I don't know, like we need to figure out this complexity stuff. Oh, I, yeah, and it's. I guess I'll plug one of the podcasts I do to, mm. to end this off. But uh, the podcast I do, Mortal Science, emerges is out of these questions. Like yep. Um, yep. we call it before and after Marxism. And so it's a little bit niche, but it actually is specifically about like, you know, how, why are the analytic Marxists so close to being right, but wrong because of this, this, and this, why is so much Marxism basically eschatology or is philosophically like bounded off in its own weird niche tradition? Um, Why are, you know, why, why is this claim for this and this and this to be the immortal science, like laughable because it doesn't even have basic, scientific or historical concepts correct and um you know and the thing is esri and i are both i mean i think esri might be closer to a post-marxist now but Mm. we're we're both we both come straight out of the marxist tradition in this Mm. regard and it's a it's a kind of an imminent and internal critique to people just not being rigorous uh, in these kind of in in this kind of thinking at all yeah um Yep. And to try to be more rigorous and try to be less dogmatic in approaching a lot of these questions, because you can't argue from logical necessity a hundred percent of the time. If your if your premises are wrong, it won't matter. Yep. Right. Yep. Like. Yep. Uh, I'm also I'm also going to recommend, and I think this is, how, this is how I found you in the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. All of the episodes you've done with some some side chats um, on uh, in the enemy camp, I think they're all amazing. And everyone should check them out. That's ah, cool. yes, the me talking about reactionary thinkers and make it 
You know, I'm often, it's funny because I'm often uh, almost, I'll be a little bit honest with you. I'm often almost frustrated with um, trying to, trying to talk about right wing theory mm-hmm. to left wingers because um, it's hard to get them into the mindset to understand what the claims are. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think Swamp Side Chats is a good way to do that. But I've heard other attempts to engage, like, with enemy camp thinking. And a lot of times, they like, the people don't... They come in with such radically different pr- uh, presumptions to the text that mm. they actually don't really understand the claims of the text. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and uh, that that is always fascinating for me when I go in with... Um, you know, talking about like all these right wing things, and yeah, they always I like I, I, they don't always ask me on for enemy camp episodes, but usually I'm the person they can find who's read it already, um, <laughs> because I spent a lot of my life, um, you know, on the on the paleo conservative right, but also like reading right wing political theory and trying to work out why anyone would have believed it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I strongly. I also just think Trump's like chance is pretty good in general. I normally yeah. don't like book club podcasts because I think people should read the goddamn book. Mm-hmm. But um, um, I think it's uh, I think it's super helpful. Um, and and some of the stuff, yeah, like you know, let them read Evola so you don't have to. I guess. Yeah. yeah but. Okay. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, but on other, yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I think I'm particularly proud of like um, the Demestra episode mm-hmm. I did with them, um, and the uh, and um, a recent episode in San Francis and yeah, episodes of Maury really Rothbart. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so people can understand, you know, the, the kind of intellectual vanguard of it. the other thing though the only thing i will say uh as a mild critique of what we do there is frankly if we really wanted to do the enemy camp real justice we'd also have to read a lot of like normie reactionary shit that yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah, it's yeah, yeah, less yeah. sexy yeah. um and no one no one on the left really wants to read that like does it yeah. it's really hard to get someone to read like like uh russell kirk or um or william buckley or uh uh, people who are actually more commonly read than like mm. super far right weirdos um, on the right. I mean, like how many rightists have read Evola versus like Milton Friedman? Like, uh, you know, I think, I think, I think, the, uh, that's my bet. I think the ratio over the last couple of years is like started slipping, but yeah, I get your point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I think actually you're correct. Um, uh, but it's still like, you know, I, I, I am not. I am not so sure we have like hundreds of thousands of people who, who can uh, quote ride the tiger to me. Yeah. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, uh, you know, are 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 would I explain that like Ernst Younger hated fascists, um, even though he was reactionary, mm. um, and so did Spengler. Yep. Um, yep. Or when I try to get someone to understand that like. <laughs> that like there are internal divisions to fascism that are not insignificant <laughs> or, um, or, you know, or, yeah, I mean, are, are that like, Hey, the can some of these conservative and right wing thinkers hate each other as much as leftists hate each other. Yeah. yeah and yeah. you should understand that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I really, I really do hate like the meme where it's like, you know, the right is like really unified and the left is not, um, Especially because you know that's you, yeah that's horseshit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And especially because you know, like you go, um, you know, you go like scroll through like a right wing or like a reactionary Twitter feed, and like you'll see them be like, yeah, you know, like just George Soros is like paying like queer antifa to like beat up people who you know <laughs> hate like like white people, like yeah, you know, and you're like, all right, yeah, they're basically. They basically only appear to be unified off of oppositional fear, which mm. is also somewhat true for us. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, you could tell neither engaging in the intellectual traditions nor, you know, I, I don't necessarily want people to go out and like subject themselves to parlor 
to understand the alt right, <laughs> but um, and QAnon and all that. But I have told people, for example, that like, hey, you know, almost as many Q people got got uh, won primaries and a couple got seats as DSAers. So um, if you think they're marginal, they're bigger than you, mm. and what you know. So yeah. Right. Anyway. I think I think that's a good place to. I don't it. envy uh, you having to edit this. Oh, yeah. it's gonna be so much fun! I'm gonna get to listen to you a lot, so it's gonna be great. Hey, I decided to include some poetry by uh, Derek at the end of this. Hope you enjoy. Our first poem for this evening will be interrogative. Interrogative. Do you dream of vultures picking at the roadside deer, stripping it down to the framing and interlace like a negligee in autumn? Do you take the bullet train to the edge of the world, watch oceans fall into the abyss of stars, despite the impossible cosmology? Do you know the continental drift, pulling the plates apart from their marriage, a slow spat between ashen, rocky lovers, until they crash into a new partner? Do you see the trains coming in from Russia to Paris, across the Asian tundra. Do you know where we wait for each other? Do you know my ex-wife? Do you know the ache of scavenging? Do you see the caribou carcass in the distance buzzing alone? Do you know the tracks we called sweetie and darling do not end? Do you know they keep going? Do you want to save me from this wandering? Do you want to keep me like a locket, close to your heart, but covered in metal? Do you care that this is not about you? Do you see the sky? Do you know it's empty? Do you care? Do you? (laughs) 